sorry about that. <clears throat> I didn't realize we'd be d directly on Skype. I didn't have Skype open. Oh, no worries. How you doing? Good. How's it going? Let me see. Am I not coming through video? Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah. There you okay, are. Good. All right. <laughs> Looks like to... I'm hearing myself. Um. Well, hopefully not. Let's see. How's that? Testing, testing. One, two, three. Everybody, welcome to the stream. This is me testing still, but I will go ahead and say a couple of introductory remarks. We are joined today by Professor Chris Catrone, founder of the Platypus Affiliated Society. This is the third time having him on this year. The first time was to talk about uh, is the left dead and long live the left or should we be anti-left? The... The debate that wasn't a debate between him and Benedict Cryptofash and the post-left slash anti-left people who are apparently somewhat inspired by Marx. We're not sure in what way. Um, and then we brought him back on to talk about uh, Adorno versus Lenin or Lenin versus Adorno or more importantly how he thinks about and uses both of those thinkers. And uh, then the then he, he towards the end of that stream, this is where most people focused on. He said some controversial things uh, about, uh, oh, don't waste your time on Lacan and blah, blah, blah. And so we brought Miguel in on the, the following day to kind of, you know, give his side, uh, his defense. He thinks that Lacan and Zizek are important. And so we had that conversation. And uh, and I think that a lot of people thought that it was like a, a, like a takedown. Like there were a couple of people in the comments that were acting like this was some kind of a takedown of Catrone. And I had jokingly said, Chris, that you weren't going to be welcomed back on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. And so, I, you know, that's why I wanted to bring you back on sooner was so for anybody who felt like you, it was just some hatchet job takedown of you knows better. And so that you have a chance to continue talking about what matters most to you right now in this conversation, which you said uh, would be more more on Lenin and, right. and, and political Marxism. So, yeah, do you want right. to talk a little bit about why you wanted to focus on that? Cool. cool. So, so, yeah, I yeah, thought that, um, you know, you know Lenin's, Lenin's the sticking point. point. And, um, you know, there are many ways in which Lenin becomes controversial, um, even on the left, even on the Leninist left. So, um, you know, so certainly for liberals, Lenin is uh, very controversial. Um, you know, for people who are like radical Democrats, Lenin's very controversial. Anarchists don't like Lenin. Um, but I also think that uh, Maoists, um, which means a lot of by Marxism in the new left, are not happy with Lenin, or they're not happy with leaving things at Lenin, let's put it that way. Um, and so they think that we've made a lot of progress politically since Lenin's time. Um, and so generally speaking, um, Lenin's a controversial figure across the entire left. And even Trotskyists who claim to be like Orthodox Leninists, as opposed to Stalinists, who they consider to be revisionists of Leninism, of original true Leninism, um, even Trotskyists tend to, in their own ways, distance themselves from Lenin and sort of imply a kind of preference for Trotsky over Lenin. And so I do think that this is in itself a symptom, meaning that, that Lenin, the controversy about Lenin is an important historical node out of which all sorts of issues, questions, and problems are constellated. And so I think it's very useful uh, to take Lenin as a way of organizing those kinds of questions that come up around the struggle for socialism. I mean, basically, that's what we're talking about. Um, so even like political Marxism versus economic Marxism, the idea that there are these differences within Marxism in terms of uh, emphasis. Do you emphasize the economic side or do you emphasize the political side? Um, I think that's a symptom, too. Because I think that for Marxists of Lenin's generation, um, you wouldn't counterpose these things. Or if they became mm -hmm. counterposed, that would be immediately seen as a problem and be seen as a kind of falling away from Marxism. Yeah. 
So and that would be a line that you hold as well. Yes. Yeah. In other words, I don't think, I mean, I'm just going to say, I don't think we've made appreciable political progress in terms of the struggle for socialism since that time, since the early 20th century. I really I think that we've gotten very far away from the struggle for socialism. I think that the struggle for socialism has been liquidated. It's been sort of dissolved into other things. It's become radical democracy. It's become, you know, in the post-colonial world, nationalism. Um, it's become kind of everything but the struggle for proletarian socialism. And so I think that Lenin, I think that Lenin's a really important figure in and of himself, but he also symbolizes something. Um, because for me, you know, Lenin Trotsky in the pre kind of, you know, Stalinist era, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, like there are many figures from that era who are basically in agreement with Lenin, like on fundamental issues, they're all in agreement. They have some differences and some criticisms, but they're, they're comradely criticisms. They're part of the same movement. Um, you know, they're working together for the same goal. They have the same self-understanding about what they're doing, what they're struggling for and how they're struggling for it. They actually agree on all those things. And so, you know, even though Lenin is a kind of particular figure, he also represents when people reject Lenin or criticize Lenin, they're actually criticizing Marxism. And that would include Marx and Engels. So there's a lot to Marx and Engels um, that people also reject when they reject Lenin or are criticizing when they criticize Lenin. Right. So again, Lenin is a particular figure and I would defend him as a worthy character in history on his own merits. But I also think that a lot of the criticism that's thrown at Lenin and a lot of the rejection of Lenin is actually a criticism of Marxism and a rejection of Marxism, even and perhaps especially by people who think of themselves as Marxists. Right. And so I think that you've made statements. I, I, I'm going to paraphrase, but this might even be a direct quote. I think you said that there, the, without Leninism, there's no Marxism. And I think you've said this in, in two different ways. One was to say, um, yeah, that you're not a Marxist if you're not a Leninist. And then the other way was to say, without Lenin, there would be no Marx. And well, it's, it's that we wouldn't even be talking about Marx. Right. Except that, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I also will defend the, the theoretical contributions or interventions in the world of philosophy by the likes of Heidegger. And then obviously the problem that people have with Heidegger is that he's a Nazi. Okay, fair enough. Mm. But, but he was, a, he, he was a, a thinker in and of it. Yes. He was a thinker yeah. before Hitler existed or at least yes. before Hitler took power. And also yes. he had nothing to do with Hitler taking power. Yes. And no, he would have been, he, and he would have also been remembered and probably more renowned had it not been for Hitler, because obviously if he hadn't have had to say the things right. that he said to hold the rector position at Freiburg university, right. then it would have been easier for people to still engage with his contributions to philosophy. And it's not, so it's, it, it, he's, he's persisted despite Hitler. Whereas Marx, you're saying, wouldn't be remembered if not, or we wouldn't be talking about Marx if not for Lenin. But I think that this diminishes Marx in a significant way to basically say he's not a thinker whose contribution or intervention into the life of the mind was actually substantial enough to have existed without Lenin. No, no, I'm saying something somewhat different. And of course, the Heidegger, Hitler, and Marx-Lenin analogy is itself really bad, right? Um, it's not like uh, Lenin's not a thinker, he is. But it's also the case that Marx is not a philosopher the way Heidegger is. And I would say that Heidegger's philosophy and his importance as a philosopher is itself a phenomenon of anti-Marxism. And Heidegger's right. Nazism mm -hmm. is just his consistent anti-Marxism. That's all that it is. I mean, there's, you know, there are many ways that people were anti-Marxist. Um, besides being Nazis. But ultimately, Heidegger did think that the main 
enemy for him, both philosophically and politically, was Marx. Was Marx. And he gave, like, respect to Marx in the sense that he couldn't deny Marx's effect. But he also thought that Marx was a symptom of a kind of metaphysical dead end of, of Western civilization. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he did, I mean, Heidegger did think that he was responding to the philosophical challenge of Marx, but that was after the Russian Revolution. Heidegger would never have thought of his project in those terms if the Russian Revolution, Lenin, had not taken place. So um, I, what I'm saying is if the Second International had been defeated by World War I, if there had been no Russian Revolution, if there had been no Third International, if the Second International had simply been defeated by World War I, Marx would have become a minor figure in history. He would have not been seen, he's not seen now, like in philosophy departments, Marx is not seen as a philosopher. He's not. Um, philosophers don't recognize Marx as a philosopher, nor they should, should they. They should not see Marx as a philosopher. Marx was not a philosopher. What was Marx? He was a revolutionary. And like any human being, he had an education, meaning he was a political revolutionary. And he was, of course, educated, like many people in the 19th century were, in philosophy and in the debates around philosophy of his time. But Marx is not original philosophically. He isn't. What he raises in his politics and again, we wouldn't we wouldn't care about him as a figure if it were, weren't for the Russian Revolution. What he raises in terms of as a as a father of a revolutionary ideology, that revolutionary ideology raises philosophical questions. And if people have been struggling with those questions in the 20th century, it's because they've been struggling with political fact of that revolutionary ideology having an effect in the world. Now, before the Russian Revolution, there were people who were dealing with Marx um, intellectually, but they were motivated by his influence in a real world political movement. So sure. people like Max Weber were responding to the rise of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, which was the largest party in Germany. And it was not only the largest party in Germany, it was the largest political party organized in the way that it was in the world. All right, so people like Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson also studied the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And they studied it more as a, like a political phenomenon. And they, 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 they understood that Marx provided a kind of ideology for that movement but they paid attention to it because of the strength of the movement, right? Right. They they thought that the ideas from Marx were more or less a kind of justification for the movement, but the movement is what they felt like they had to reckon with as a fact, not some like new philosophy, Mm -hmm. right? They were like, what the hell is this? The working class is organizing itself. It thinks it's struggling for socialism. What does it mean by this? What do we do about it? And I always like to say, we have to remember that for people who are not socialists, they don't disagree with socialism. That's not what's going on, right? They just don't believe it's possible, right? Like they don't, they don't think it's going to work out. Like if, you know, if you could sit Donald Trump down or Nancy Pelosi, right? Or Kamala Harris, if you could sit them down and say, you know what, dictatorship of the proletariat, centered in the United States as the heart of global capitalism, why not do that? Let's try that. Right? If you could convince them that it would work, they would be on board with it. Right? So the question is, why would they not be convinced that it could work? Because they would say, well, you know... Well, they would, of course, say it was tried before. Mm -hmm. It led to totalitarianism, so we know it doesn't work. But if you set Teddy Roosevelt down or Woodrow Wilson, 
right? In 1912, when the American, the Socialist Party of America got the largest share of the vote in the U.S. presidential election. Lenin wrote about that, by the way. He said, this shows that we're on the way to world revolution. It was also the year 1912 that the SPD in Germany got the largest share of the vote. And that led directly to World War I because the German high command was like, we got to start a war to deflect this, right? right? Now, if you set Teddy Roosevelt down or Woodrow Wilson down, you probably get a better hearing from Teddy Roosevelt than from Woodrow Wilson, by the way. Yeah. Because Woodrow Wilson was a fucking racist. But Teddy Roosevelt, you know, we could maybe make some headway with because the Republicans were progressive back then, more progressive than the, than the, than the Democrats before FDR. And, you know, again, they would say, well, you know, this society is too complex. Like the idea of a radical democratic revolution led by socialists with a dictatorship of the proletariat that's going to socialize the economy and free us of these impersonal forces of capitalism that seem to affect things in a negative way. They would just say that sounds good, but society is just too complex to, right. to do that. Right. And probably it's going to have a negative effect. And then, of course, their own biases would creep in and they would say, well, you know, the working is the working class really ready for taking power? Like, don't you need a kind of educated elite that's sort of benevolently, humanistically motivated to like try the right policies? I mean, this is what we're dealing with today. This is what the Democrats are today. Right. The Democrats today, they don't believe in putting the working class in power by any means. You lost. Right? The, I I think we just lost you on the camera side. Did uh, oh okay no you oh, still you're heard me? You're back. You heard well, me. We heard you. Yeah. So you're you're saying that you see yourself as as sitting down Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, except that it's the Democrats right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, what would they say? They would not say we're against equality. They would not say we're like for capitalism, right? They would not say you know we really like the fact that the economy goes through these cycles that are hugely destructive and that ruin millions of people's lives every once in a while and set back social progress and generate all sorts of, you know, dangerous political movements and, you know, violence in society. You know, they would say, you know, we're not in favor of that. They would just say, this is the best we can do. What we have now is the best we can do. Right now, what what I'm going like to tell Churchill you is quote, right. The Churchill quote is that democracy yeah. is like the worst possible case thing, but it's also like still the lesser evil. Yes, and that's basically. I mean, check this out. I myself would make Churchill's comment my own. I would say the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the struggle for socialism is probably the worst form of politics we can possibly have, except everything else. Right? Yeah. That's what I would say. I would make that my own because I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's going to bring about heaven on earth or something like that. I just think it's necessary. Right. And that as long as we keep avoiding this necessity, we're going to be going through this shift. Now, what I'm saying is I, I suspect, you know, I don't want to get psychoanalytic, but I suspect that unconsciously you and everybody else don't believe socialism is possible. I definitely don't think that uh, what most people mean by socialism, at least by mo most people, I mean most people I've had conversations with when they're talking about it, I do, don't think that what they're talking about is possible or even Well, feasible, then you got to reckon with that. What's that? You got to reckon with that because that's why you're afraid of Lenin. Because you think this kind of politics that I'm trying to defend here is not going to work and would just make things worse. So, there, the, yeah, there's layers to this on you. Yeah, but, uh, you want to keep going though, uh, or, or yeah, like, I mean, like, I kind of there's so many like lines of questioning that I want to take on this, and I, I think no, no, you're that's not. Good. I think you're not wrong, <laughs> and you're right that I am contending with this right now. Um, with with Marxism specifically, thought thought of as Leninism, for instance. You know, my Leninist friends always say that you know, 
give or take a few other things that Marx might have thought, for them it always boils down to the one thing for certain, and that is the dictatorship of the proletariat and thinking of socialism as that. And for me, that's way downstream from yes. a lot of other foregone conclusions, and yes. it's it's a conceptualization of the world. So first came interpretation, then mm. came this intervention. And you're saying Marx was uh, not a... They're he, connected. He, Marx was a revolutionary, not just a philosopher. Well, he was a philosopher at first, and the philosophy he did brought him to the conclusion, dictatorship of the proletariat. The question is, is was that the necessary conclusion? Was that the true conclusion? Could that have been an error? And then here's the other problem. Because he didn't really think it through very thoroughly, like what that would look like, does it have to look like what Lenin thinks it looks like? Or... I mean, let me put it to you this way in terms of Marx himself. So Marx is a bohemian radical intellectual who would have been like a radical Democrat and like a radical liberal and kind of a romantic figure. You know, he wrote very dark poetry. And, you know, like he was just a revolutionary. Right. So he's from Germany. It's a Prussian autocracy. It's a post-French Revolution, restoration monarchy, reactionary state. He's a revolutionary. He can't live there anymore. He can't live in his home country. He has to leave because he's too radical. That's who he is. Like, that's essentially who he is. He's not a philosopher who's like, you know what? Philosophically, I've arrived at socialism. No, he was going to be a political radical no matter what. That's the first thing we have to be clear about. Now, that's, that's a problem. Right. In other words, then you might say, well, can we trust his philosophical thinking if it's so interested and motivated? It's not a matter of that. Is it like adequately philosophically grounded? You know, does he have his theory straight before he like sets up his practice? It's rather, is he self-aware enough of himself? Right. And. Again, I always like to put it this way. Marx is only Marx because of when he lived in world history. You know, so he is a genius, like definitely. But there are many geniuses and there are many geniuses we will never hear of. Right. Well, so, I think the, the Hegelian idea is that, you know, what makes a philosopher is not just genius, but it's also the ability to articulate the spirit of the times. Right. Yes. And so Marx, to me, is a historical figure, meaning he captured something and we have to take that seriously, meaning he he had a profound influence in his own lifetime already, but he had an even greater influence after his lifetime. And thinking about how and why that might be the case, like, you know, Lenin fell in love with Marx you know, kind of read everything he could possibly get his hands on by Marx. And according to his wife, basically had all of Marx's works memorized. Yeah, yeah. But it comes across like a Christian fundamentalist who yeah. has found meaning through the Bible and now is, you know, memorizing scripture while going but again, around. Again, ostensibly have... doing everything that he does in life, you know, on that basis, but also able to use it in whatever way to justify anything he's going to do anyway. Well, I mean, you could think of it that way. But again, the question, like, with whether it's Marx or Lenin or someone like Rosa Luxemburg or Trotsky, these people would have been political radicals no matter what. They would have been revolutionaries no matter what. So you you, you disagree with uh, Arendt's, I like to bring in her spicy takes, but uh, in Men in Dark Times, she says that, because she writes a, she does a lecture on, or like a, I don't know, she gives a speech on Rosa. And mm -hmm. she's, and she says, Rosa might not have liked me, but I liked her. And then she says that Rosa would have been a scientist had it not been for the revolution. Lenin would have been a politician no matter what. So you disagree with that statement? I do disagree. And it all depends on what one means by the revolution. Meaning neither Lenin nor Rosa Luxemburg nor Trotsky nor a host of other people Clara Zetkin, Eugene Debs, they would not have been who they were if there hadn't been this party. The German Social Democratic Party and a second international that they organized. If that didn't exist, and if Marxism didn't make sense to them, 
they wouldn't have joined. But it, it, it did make sense to them. So again, we're talking about the connection between ideas, social, and very importantly, political realities. How do these ideas resonate with political realities? How are they plausible? Marxism is an ideology. I know that you know people hate that. They're going to be like, no, it's science. No, let's just be real. Marxism is an ideology. And the reason that I say that is because Marxism doesn't exempt itself from its own science. And its science is not a kind of, you know, Anglo-American notion of science, like empirical objective science. The science is Wissenschaft, it's Hegelian science, it's self-consciousness, it's self-awareness. Right. So you're Marxism, saying that the, that this mm -hmm. that this German word for science, Wissenschaft, uh, is the yes. uh, it's it's self consciousness. That's how you yes. would define that. I took it to be some kind of like a a systematized body of knowledge, not in this sort of scientific the positivist science sense that usually people think of today. Right. But but you're you're specifically it's saying it's self consciousness. Word. It's a common word, but what I'm saying is that. Marx agrees with Hegel okay. that the highest science is the self-consciousness of science. Okay. Right. In other words, naive science is not quite scientific. You know, empirical science is not quite scientific. Science has to explain its own science to itself. Okay. Right. And so Wissenschaft, and, you know, again, this is going to be controversial because it's going to be like, well, is philosophy the highest science? Not exactly, because it's not about like higher or lower. It's about a level of self-critical reflexivity. And that's why Marx can be a Hegelian critic of Hegel. And this is why analytic philosophers today, which is by, you said Marx is not considered a philosopher in, in philosophy departments today. And that's a largely to do with, you know, through the Cold War and since it's analytic philosophy has been what dominates. And obviously what they do is they focus on minutia. And I would say they do it in a not very self-critical way. They don't think about their class standing while they're looking at a logical problem, for instance. They are self-critical, but in a very narrowed way. And the reason that they wouldn't consider Marx a philosopher is that he never produced any work of philosophy. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like, you know, he doesn't have any philosophical writings that are simply philosophy. So the 1844 manuscripts or like no. his, the his thesis on Epicurus, these are not... That would be the closest thing, his, his thesis. The 1844 manuscripts is a critique of Proudhon, I hope you know. So it's an unfinished work. It was written as a critique of Proudhon's What is Property? And that's why he uses the term property instead of capital. Hmm. Right, which, I mean, he'll sometimes use capital there, but the reason he's like property, 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 it's not because... He didn't yet understand that there was capital. It's because he was writing an imminent critique of Proudhon using Proudhon's own categories. I see. Um, yeah. And so, again, and it's a critique of socialism, right? But, but I mean, it's not when he like... Gets going in the, he, when he gets going in a strange labor, it doesn't seem like an imminent critique. And in fact, it's, it's not even the critique of political economy because he – the first paragraph is him basically setting aside – political economy he's no he's not like, setting it aside he's saying we of, accept it well, no exactly he, he says well we can accept everything it's saying but then here at the end of the day wh what we see is still what we see and what do we see and then he goes with what he sees right and so in that sense he seems very very like he's just being very descriptive right um, you won't know what it is if you don't know the Proudhon because Proudhon himself is a Hegelian yeah. and a Smithian Right. So, you know, we usually there's like the three component parts of Marxism, you know, British political economy, um, German philosophy and French socialism. Right. It's not the synthesis of those three things positively. It's the critique of those three things in light of each other. Right. And Marx didn't initiate that. Proudhon initiated it because Proudhon thought of himself as, uh, he said, I only have three masters, Hegel, Adam Smith, and the Bible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're you're and, right that I, I've, I've known for a long time I need to read Proudhon like directly. I, I've read, you know, things about Proudhon and Marx and their, and their disagreements and such, you know, obviously. Read the, I, the um, Philosophy of Misery by Proudhon and okay. read Marx's critique of it, which is the poverty of philosophy. Right. Okay. Right. 
And so, again, it's not like Marx is doing, like, philosophy over here in the German ideology, and then he's doing political economy over here in Das Kapital, and then he's doing political writings in, like, I don't know, Civil War in France, or Louis, 18th Premier of Louis Bonaparte. No, Marx is always doing all three things together and in light of each other. And so when it seems like he's just making kind of ontological statements, he's not. Because what he's doing is he's taking up the ontological statements of others, especially socialists and communists of his time. Right. So Proudhon had no problem making kind of ontological assertions about, you know, his own political vision and basically weaving a tapestry, a cosmology. And Marx is saying, whoa, whoa, hey, wait a second. Right. Let's see what these things, you know, what the component parts are and what they're about and how they relate to each other. I mean, why Hegel is such an important figure is that, of, of course, Hegel himself is himself doing a kind of connection between politics, economics and philosophy. Right. You know, and again, as an Enlightenment thinker, Kant, too, by the way, Kant, too. And that's why poor Kant gets saddled with being the author of only the critique of pure reason. Kant is a political philosopher, too. I mean, right. you know, it's or, or Adam well, Smith I, is treated as an economist. It's, he's not. He's a moral philosopher. This, this, you know, and I'm glad you're pointing it out. This before philosophy was sort of compartmentalized into a into a department at yeah. a college within a university, you know, it philosophy was kind of considered like the entry point into every more specific science. And, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the P and PhD is philosophy. I, yep. But obviously most people who have PhDs today have never, are not really philosophers. Spent much, they've not, right. not only are they not philosophers, but they've not even spent much time with philosophy. And then they kind of kind of say yes. something that belongs in that weirdo department over there. That's right. But, but then, and you know, so you're pointing out something like maybe Descartes, was there like a, was Descartes actually a philosopher of politics as well? Not in the way that uh, Hobbes was, not in the way that Kant but was. But Spinoza was. But Spinoza was? Yeah. He wrote about politics as well as, you know, what we would call ontology. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I've, you know, read the ethics, but I've not read anything else by him and obviously I need to, but um, yeah. So That's I what he got in trouble for. He got more in trouble for the politics. See, he's a he's a radical Democrat. He's a bourgeois revolutionary thinker, you know. Based. Cool. Well, so, yeah. You, okay. Fair enough. So we no. can't take our own fragmented consciousness for granted. Yeah, because none of these guys were right. Is yeah. Your point. Okay. They're Renaissance humanists, you know. Well, and and, and then I I would say that Marx onward. There's a there's a problem with calling them philosophers because they didn't call themselves philosophers. Marx does anti philosophy, especially towards. I mean, there's the he does argument. not do anti philosophy. Let's be careful. Let's not sneak in any Althusser or Heidegger or anything else, right? Like, let's be careful because that whole thing, you know, maybe starting with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche of anti philosophy is itself a, a, a symptom. Right. It's a symptom. Again, all of these things are in the capitalist era. You know, yes. why would you not have anti-philosophy before the 19th century? This capitalism, like all of this is due to capitalism. Right. That total. Well, what, what about capitalism made it so that. Well, OK, so for, well, there's two things here. What made it so that all of these other people t became anti-philosophy? But then the other thing is, why are you saying that? Marx was not anti-philosophy, and then you're saying that that's more like Althusser's reading of the situation. Those are two questions. Let's. Well, right. So basically, um, the critique of the German ideology, namely of the young Hegelians, yes, and of their philosophy, is a critique of their politics because the young Hegelians were politically radical, and most of them were socialists or communists. Mm -hmm. And I would say even someone like Max Stirner is, right, so he's not like some kind of apostle of some kind of, I don't know, individualism or something like that, that, you know, the ego in its own is a theory of society too, mm -hmm. right? And so it's all, you know, it's, it's all of its moment, 1830s, 1840s, 
Um, you know, in Platypus this summer, we're reading Auguste Comte, the father of positivism. And, you know, so he's the father of, like, social physics, positive science. He's a socialist. He's a utopian socialist. He's a Saint-Simonian socialist. He's a revolutionary. He's like, we're carrying on the French Revolution, and we're proceeding, and our philosophy is going to appeal to the working class and to women, mm-hmm. right? Because they're the oppressed and exploited, and the ruling class is not going to listen to us, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is all before Marx. Right. Marx arrives and there's a whole world of socialism and communism in politics, philosophy, economics. There's a whole world. You could almost say we act like he, the earth stood still and he came down from a, a Right. Marx didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> Marx did not come out of nowhere. He right. did not. Marx crystallizes a moment in history, the 1840s. You know, he's a brilliant young man and he has the advantage of meeting a partner in crime, Engels. And then they can be like little crazy people together, bouncing ideas off each other. And it just becomes a laboratory. Right. You well, know, it, 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 it takes at least a couple of people having a serious conversation to really get anything underway. And, uh, and it really, it takes, they met all the actors too. They met all the big names. Take someone with deep pockets, socialism. though, funding somebody like Marx to be able to do what he was doing. Really. Engels, so, sure. Yeah, because, you know, he was And uh, it, so. poor, you know, Marx's wife. And, you know, I mean, there's like, you know, I mean, you know, they're Bohemians and they're, they're that's a hard scrabble existence. And, you know, I mean, right. Right. So, like, and they were all dying from cancer constantly, background. apparently. Like, everyone was dying from cancer. But, so it wasn't there when when they were being chased out of the country, family members were dying from cancer, and it was just like continuous agony. But I, mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. in the chat said to not forget about Lenin here, and I don't want to. And in fact, yeah, we're gonna I, come I wanna, back to I wanna, Lenin. I wanna I wanna go back to the question on Althusser because I think it's a way to get back to Lenin. Althusser was a Leninist, was he not? No, and he's not. He, he's a Stalinist. Okay, now this is just okay. Hot takes Seriously. all around. Seriously. I want to know more about what you think about Althusser and why you think that what Althusser was saying about Marx being anti philosophy is what, what, what goes wrong here? Look, there's something, you know, I don't want to get into Lacan, Althusser, Zizek, that turn, the Lacanian turn, because that's what we're talking about. That's where Althusser You're, you're saying goes. Althusser is just part of that? Yes, very yeah. directly. Um, he is influenced by pre-Socratic philosophy, Heidegger, as well, and he has to. He's a member of the Communist Party of France, and he has to fly under some false flags. He himself later said so, oh. and you know he had to advance an agenda that was still politically oriented. He, you know, he did have his political orientation, but I would say that political orientation was fundamentally Stalinist and then Maoist, right? So he's sympathetic with the Chinese in the Sino-Soviet split, but he remains member of the Communist Party, right? So he keeps his dissidents under wraps politically, but also philosophically, he really is, you know, into ontological materialism in a pre-Socratic sense. And, you know, like, look, so to get back to... In a pre-Socratic sense, a kind of materialism that predates Socrates. Yes, that predates Plato and Aristotle. Absolutely. And you're saying Lenin was not, and Marx was no, not. No, Marx is not. In fact, but, you mentioned Marx's thesis, right? Democritus and Epicurus. Marx was not a pre-Socratic, right? Like, if you read it, I haven't it's read very it, so. clear. Yeah, I mean, he is a German idealist. He's coming out of Kant and Hegel. There's no going back to ancient materialism. There's no, okay. Right? But... Poor Althusser is lost. I mean, the point of the matter is, with the 20th century, no, 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 we're dealing with people lost in the world. They're thrown, to use a Heidegger expression. They're (laughs) thrown. And what do they reach for? Some kind of philosophical grounding. That's a mistake. Right? Because they lose their political footing, and they look for a philosophical grounding. And that's where we are, by the way. Like, people don't know which way is up. Sure. I I definitely don't. But you're saying that... Neither did that Althusser. problem started a long time ago. That problem started after Hegel. So I have an old Althusserian friend. He, he just retired. I think he's 63, 64. And he 
doesn't watch my streams. He he likes the fact that I do them so much that he he's be, he's been a patron even after I closed down my Patreon like over a year ago. He just keeps sending me money because he's like, just keep doing what you're doing, Dave. You're doing great. And I'm like, all right, man, thanks. But he was like an Althusserian, like a hardcore Althusserian through the '60s, and then like there was a point when he stopped being one. I think it was when Althusser choked his wife <laughs> and killed her, you know. And so, you know, and the, the the whole group kind of fizzled out. And then you know his reflect. I've I've gotten. It's been a privilege over the years, you know, going out to f- for food with him and hearing his reflections on that period. But what I, I mean, do, but, 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 but what I wanted to say is yeah. sh- shout out to Bert. You know, he's actually been watching all of these. He, he loves everything you have to say and finds it fascinating. And like, mm. that's why I said he doesn't usually watch my stuff, but he's watched all of the stuff that we've talked about. Oh, okay. And, but he, yeah, he really liked El Thuzer. And then he also really likes like, the, the position you're advancing. And so that's kind of also, I mean, beyond the fact that I'm curious about Arthur Sarah, I am just more curious to like, know how you see, mm-hmm. this, you see him as a Stalinist Maoist who like turned away from politics. I'm not using philosophy. these terms. I'm not using these terms just pejoratively, by the way, let's just be clear about that. Right. Um, you know, there's real history to the 20th century. I'm not trying to dismiss real history. What I'm saying is, what are the enduring problems that we still have to grapple with? And I don't think that Stalin or Mao or Lacan or Althusser actually provided the solutions. I think that there were these moments where people were struggling for a solution. I think that, as it turns out, they did not provide the solution. Now... I'm not saying Lenin provided the solution. I'm not. What I'm saying is that I the swear problem... That's what you're, I, I swear that's what you're saying, though. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is is that there's a higher problem okay. with Lenin than there is with Althusser or Stalin or Mao. Right? Higher. So a higher problem, namely the problem of world socialist revolution, which Stalin gave up on and Mao is not pursuing. Mao basically was agnostic. You know, when the Americans went to meet Mao... You know, they said, we want to be Maoist. And he said, don't be a Maoist. You have to find an American road to socialism. That's not Lenin. Lenin's not a Russian road to socialism. Right? That's the Stalinist misreading, and that's also the Western dismissal. Lenin is a member of the Second International. He's a Marxist. He's a world socialist revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just a different view of things. He's a Marxist. Like, we don't have Marxists anymore because we we don't have this perspective anymore. And, you know, there are many reasons for that. What I'm saying is we have to get back to the problems of that and how people have dealt with it historically. And what we'll find is that there are no answers or solutions. What there are are questions and problems. But we're in danger of ignoring or avoiding those problems by immediately going to oh Althusserian materialism it's like wait that doesn't help us it really doesn't it might like help you feel like you know like the nature of reality or something that's not what we have to deal with that's not it's it's what uh Marx said in the theses on Feuerbach he said the question of the reality or unreality of thought is a scholastic question it's just you not also a like Ador- you also like Adorno who thinks that when he says that he says it with such uh, emphasis because he probably didn't believe it himself. No, no, that's about uh, changing the world. That's the eleventh thesis. Okay. This is an earlier thesis on Feuerbach where he says the reality or unreality of thought is a scholastic question, and it's not like Adorno rejected the thesis on Feuerbach. He just said to his students, "Don't throw that shit in my face because you don't even know what the fuck you're talking about." <laughs> and you know i'm with him on that one come on they didn't know what he was talking about right but they didn't know but, what Ad- but adorno also about. says that you know he he clearly spent like the first part of his life interpreting mark and you're saying you're saying it sounds yeah. to me like you're saying we don't need to interpret even though we don't know what's up and what's down no no interpret it depends on what we're interpreting not just the world marx is interpreting a emerging and constituted proletarian socialist movement 
right? So there are like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of working class people organizing themselves saying, we want socialism. We want to abolish property and the means of production, right? That was his object. That's how he understood capitalism through that object. Whereas today, it's like, what, we're going to watch CNBC and say, what's the nature of reality? So Marx was trying to say, what kind of reality produces a proletarian socialist movement trying to overthrow everything about that reality, right? It's a different way of accessing reality, mm. right? It's a connection between theory and practice. And again, for him, he had a critique of this movement, you know, not because he was like, smart, you know, and like, oh, well, they don't know what they're doing. It's rather, you know, it's commodity fetishism. It's the phantasmagoria. It's that we're stumbling in the dark here. We live in an alienated society. We're trying to change it from within the society. But we're also in a realm of smoke and mirrors. Right. 100%. Well, I agree with you on all of that. But it sounds like what you're saying, though, is that the solution to getting out of the smoke and mirrors and not knowing what's up and what's down is just to through it. subscribe to Leninism. Wh no, no, when no, no, no. What you're saying about Marx and Lenin is that they were both able to presuppose a, a an emerging, rising workers' movement that was centering the working class. That this and that there were yeah uh, tens of thousands of organized uh, leftists and, and that that, but that's not here now. And so it's not here now. That's right. So we but can't we need presuppose to try to that, get back so. to that. We yeah. need to try to get back to that. And that movement also didn't come purely spontaneously out of the working class, but came out of a connection between bohemian dissident radical revolutionary intellectuals and workers who were just thrown into this kind of environment together in the early 19th century. Um, you know, D-class A intellectuals, you know, whether D-class A like aristocrats, D-class A, What's bourgeois. C -class a? Yeah. And, What's D-class A? Oh, that they fell from their class position. D-classed. Oh. D-classed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in other words, Marx lived in a working class neighborhood in, in London, among other poor people. That's right. that. Right? Okay. And, you know, so it's not like there was a different reality out there that he wasn't part of. Now, things are different now in terms of intellectual life and in terms of how class functions. It's not the Charles Dickens universe exactly, but it, right. you know, actually it's got a lot of similarities to that universe. And I would just say, you know, I think I put it to you in another of our talks. I think working class intellectuals, young people who are interested in like politically trying to overcome capitalism. My advice is don't start with philosophy about that. Meaning, of course, philosophy is a wonderful terrain to explore, but don't think that philosophy is going to tell you straight up about the nature of capitalism because it's not. It's only going to do so in an indirect and mediated way. And only if you see it as ideology, right? So Marx did think that philosophy was ideology. Uh, he thought everything was ideology, by the way. Sure. Socialism was, was ideology. Um, and philosophy does give expression to capitalism, but almost unintentionally. In other words, whenever philosophers think, you know, in the modern capitalist era, whenever they make assertions about the nature of reality, what they're really describing is capitalism, but in a mystified way. Sure. Right. And again, capitalism, not as an economic system, not as a bunch of digits on a balance sheet. Capitalism as a social reality and as a crisis of society and as a contradiction above sure. all else. Right. So the idea is that that contradiction ramifies into various domains and shows up in various different concrete forms, including in the way people think, including in attempts to formalize thinking, which is what philosophy is. Because of course, the other thing that I don't like about the emphasis on philosophy 
is, you know, I come from an art background, uh, also a literary background. I don't think that <laughs> philosophy sums up all the ways that we can think. I think mm. that we can think through images, through sounds. We can think through, you know, space and time and, and aesthetic forms. We can think in practical terms, like the idea that thought is reducible to formal philosophy is a big mistake. That's a huge mistake. I think all of the thinkers that I subscribe to agree with you to some extent and approach that in their own ways. But also, I have my pre-philosophy days, pre-philosophy, Dave, to compare. Okay, so... I was in the workforce for a decade before I knew that what philosophy was. I didn't know who's I I didn't know my Plato for my Socrates before I went to college and I only went to college after I burnt out on every entry level job that I could start at. And so it's like I had I I had uh access to the the world of art and and aesthetic mm -hmm. things prior mm -hmm. to philosophy. Mm -hmm. But I would say it was uh so did I. Mm -hmm. Getting into philosophy, though, I was like, oh, okay, this is what's been missing, right? Like, the, the, there's a lot here that's been missing. But so I just say that as a way to be like, yeah, you know I what agree. philosophy I, can do? It can help you think about the way you think. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And what what's interesting about philosophy, and all the really great philosophers understood this, whether it's Kant or Hegel or Nietzsche or anybody really, like you know, even like Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, is that they were trying to make people think about things that couldn't be written on a page. Right. Yeah. 100%. Right. Right. So the idea is like, you know, actually what's more important about philosophy is not as it's written on the page, but in how it makes you think, including in how it makes you think against what you've just read on the page. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and right? I'll just use one concrete example. It's like, if you believe that, there's a true you that's simply, you know, a little lost, but you can find your way back to your true self by discovering your true self and then being your true self, right? Well, if and maybe you don't think about it in such simplistic terms, but that's ultimately the base assumption is that, well, there's you and there's just you and it's a singular unified you and then you just got to figure out what that is and be it. Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of presuppositions that go into that, and it's and it's going to be particularly problematic when you think about well, you want to do this, but you also want to do that. You want to do this thing that is a longer term project, but you also want to do this shorter term thing that undermines that longer term project. You and have you to feel, discipline yourself. You feel pulled and, in multiple directions, and then you yeah, do things I mean, that you don't agree with. This this is where you know having a, a a functional theory of subjectivity comes in, right? Like for me. I had like this really stupid self-conception and belief in there being just, oh, it's just me and, I, and I'm just this, right? Just, just wait a second though, Dave, So because yeah. I feel like we're going off the rails a bit, yeah. is that it's not about who am I, right, as like a subject, right? Because frankly, yes, I'm multiple subjects circumstantially depending on situations and contexts and relations, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But it is about, is there a part of me that's going to contribute to the struggle for socialism? Right? It's not going to be all of me, but is there going to be part of me? And are there going to be enough people like me who are giving enough of themselves to this struggle that, can, that it can amount to something politically? And so it is about discipline, right? So it's it's literally like, you know, learning something, you discipline yourself to it. Yeah. Going to a job, you discipline yourself to it. You know, the struggle for socialism is a discipline. It's not an inclination. It's not like I feel like it or I don't feel like it. It's something that you have to give yourself to. Being an artist, you have to give yourself to it. Politics, you do have to give yourself to it. And why are we afraid of that? We give ourselves to things all the time, and I feel like we give ourselves excuses to never submit ourselves politically. And then what do we do? We just become drones in capitalist politics, right? We let our minds become invaded by capitalist ideology, capitalist politics, by the issues that they want to manipulate us with. 
Yeah, whatever, whatever right. we're supposed to care about today. Uh... Right? And no, the struggle for socialism, can we discipline ourselves to that? Can we subordinate at least part of ourselves to that? Can we say, I'm dedicating myself to that? So what you said earlier about, you know, like a Christian fundamentalist will read the Bible and justify what they're doing by reference to the Bible. Yeah, okay, yes, we need to do something exactly like that, except not Christianity, socialism. Oh my God. <laughs> no, no, except, seriously. But also when you say that, you mean specifically Leninism, which... No, I'm saying that's what Lenin did. The, the, but you're saying that the solution to the fact that the left is dead and that we as thinkers who don't know up from down today is to presuppose something that was empirically around them at the time, which was this workers' movement that we don't have today. And that the That's solution right. is not – that philosophy is not going to help get us there. We just need to commit ourselves to a cause that isn't a thing in existence right now. It's also never going to be in existence if we don't dedicate ourselves to it. Yeah, but the, none of the people who you're talking about, these bohemian radical intellectuals who committed themselves to it, would have been able to commit themselves to it if it wasn't already there. No, some of them started it. All I'm saying is that Marx didn't start it. Right? And also, the, those who did start the socialist movement didn't start it wholly de novo. They came out of the bourgeois revolutionary tradition. So they came out of the American and French revolutions. They came out of that scene. You know, I think I pointed out that Thomas Jefferson in the last years of his life was in constant correspondence with utopian socialists and abolitionists. Right. Mm -hmm. And he, he realized, yeah, we got to take this struggle further. Right. In other words, the American Revolution and the French Revolution accomplished certain things. But now the struggle continues and now it's abolitionism. Now it's socialism. It's utopian socialism. Right. So that's where the socialist movement came from. You know, and, you know, frankly, it's not like that's extirpated. I mean, history is still with us. What I'm saying is young people, whether privileged or disadvantaged, they are ensnared by this cultural commodity called the left theory, Marxism. And it becomes something that they read about and that they tweet about but not something that they live. So, but, it, so, <laughs> I think I'm following you, but I just don't understand how, okay, so what Marx was dealing with at the time was a situation in which this emerging class called the proletariat existed and and also had the ability to pretty easily come to us a, a self-understanding as existing considering the fact that they lived on top of one another now well what i'm saying is it doesn't seem to be as far in the world you know like i don't know i feel like like progressive minded young people who grew up in the suburbs go to the city yeah and they're like oh you know and I mean, I don't know where this cultural division came from, but there obviously exists a deep cultural division between the working class and intellectuals. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, and I come from a working class background. I basically had to estrange myself from my family to become an intellectual. You I had to go to a school where I was completely out of place, where literally, you know, I had just gotten my hair cut. So I'm like 19 years old. I like my haircut is now and you know one of my professors you know i you know saw me with a little bit shaggier hair she didn't recognize me and she like jumped back she's like an old jewish lady and she said i thought you were an irish from southie and i'm like we're out in western massachusetts like how do you think a southie irish is going to show up suddenly in the hallway of the social sciences building at hampshire college because she, she literally jumped back when she saw me. You She's know? scared of Irish people? Is this what? Yeah. I mean, rightfully so. An old Jewish woman? Yeah, of course is going to be scared of an Irish Boston person. Yeah. A young punk, you know. Yeah. This definitely. is all lost on me. I've, I've got no cultural basis for understanding what you're talking about. I guess this is East Coast stuff. But anyway, 
Yeah, for sure. It, so, but you're saying that the there's this thing. division between intellectuals and workers, and that I I obviously feel that as well. Um, the, uh, but also you know isn't there something to 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 that distrust considering the fact that uh, intellectuals whether democratically or, or centralized, I mean, the working whether class from in distrust. front of or from behind, yes. are always saying, hey, we know what's in your interests. All you got to do is believe us. The workers should distrust the intellectuals. But what I'm saying is, I'm we're talking now as intellectuals. We're talking about ideas. We're talking about, like, history. We're talking about things to read, things to study, things to consider, things to sure. contemplate, things to think about, Right. And I mean, it's great that there are working class people who are also doing that. And I hope there are many, right? What I'm freaked out by is that any working class person is going to pick up Belchie's hair. What the fuck? No, 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 no. Because Althusser was a university professor, Communist Party of French, you know, France member in his intellectual world. Right? He's not dealing with working class people. Zero. None. Nada. I mean, but Nunca. his Nothing. his his work is a constant like defense of the idea that it needs to be the workers who change the t- conditions and and this an is intervention communist party and an intervention the- his ideological state apparatus thing is is an intervention essentially saying like you guys are part of this thing you didn't think that you're a part of you all what act i'm like saying is the only it. reason that you kids know anything about altuzer is because of intellectuals who have marketed altuzer the 60s generation as a kind of narcotic for themselves that they're foisting on you. What I'm saying is, no, children, no. But why? But why do they? But why do they? Go because for the this Communist as, as Party of France dominated French intellectual life after World War II. They were the biggest party. They couldn't take power because they would have started World War III. So they supported De Gaulle and they accepted basically a compromise where they got to be the faculty of the university system. Mm. And then they were like, well, we're going to struggle for socialism by propagating communist ideology at the university. And eventually, you know, these ideas will have an effect. And, you know, so what about the nature of the ideas? And they had to do it in orthodox terms, right? In other words, you have to, pay due deference to Marx and Engels and Lenin, and you have to sneak in your criticisms in these subtle reinterpretations, right? Because this kind of academic Marxism, and this is still with us today, university professors who are Marxists are the most anti-Marxist people in the world. I feel like you, really and Peter, are. you and Peterson which should like hang out and have some beers maybe. like You'd probably come to a lot of agreement about the academic Marxists today. I mean, no, because I mean, and, and you know, they just are what they are. But what I'm saying is, is that these are people who have been struggling with these ideas in a very opaque and unself-aware way okay. where it's turned into like method and this kind of thing, like intellectual method. No, right. This is not what we're talking about. Like this is where Althusser comes from. The idea that Marxism is a method it is not a method. This is not... You know, and then it's like, well, how do you define method? It becomes some kind of psychoanalytic thing. No, no, no. For him, it becomes organizing the the dictatorship of the proletariat. Like, it constantly goes back to that for him. He says so. He says so. But what I'm saying is all the steps along the way are ontological materialism. What I'm saying is you don't start there. You start with politics. You start with how are people actually struggling what are the problems and self-contradictions of that struggle? And how do you elaborate a further development of the movement and of the politics based on the problems of that struggle? And that's where it goes back to Marx, by the way, because I, I'll just say this. So Marx yeah. arrives on a scene where there's an already constituted socialist workers movement, proletarian socialist movement. But that movement is also in an impasse and a crisis in his time. So Chartism in England was at an impasse and a crisis. 
by the 1840s. Um, so there's a crisis of capitalism. There's a crisis of democracy that will lead to the 1848 revolutions. Um, that's also led to Chartism in England. Um, you know, it's the hungry 1840s, the Great Depression of the 19th century. Um, but the movement itself, I mean, that's why the letter to Ruga from 1843, where he says the reformers are confused, right? They don't know what they want. They don't know what they're doing. And all we can do is help them clarify their own confusion to themselves. We don't come with a dogma. We don't come with a ready-made solution. We only come with an attitude of taking their confusion as the starting point. Now, by the way, not to toot my own horn, I tried to do that with the millennial left, at least to some degree. In other words, I tried to identify the contradictions and confusions that were manifesting from early on and say, you know, look at, look at this confusion here and look at its historical roots and think about it as confusion, not just as wrong or mistaken, but what are people trying to get at and how are they landing in self-contradictions in their approach which is not to say take a different approach it's to say let's pay attention to that for a moment let's sit with that for a moment the self-contradictions mm -hmm. of the movement the confusions of the movement let's take that as our starting point sure and, and by and the way lenin i will say this lenin it's a very similar thing him and rosa luxembourg when they are young Marxists in their 20s, what's going on? The revisionist dispute in Marxism. The Marxism right. had come into an impasse, had come to a moment of confusion and self-contradiction. And that was their school. Right? To understand Marxism is not exempt from this. Mm -hmm. The struggle for socialism is not exempt from the contradiction of capitalism, but embodies it at an acute level. Right? So again, it's not like right or wrong, you know, this is correct, this is incorrect. It's about the impasse, the confusion, the self-contradiction itself as the starting point, which is why you don't have to start with prima philosophia ontology. You don't have to start there. And in fact, if you try to start there, you're actually getting away from the problem. Whereas you have to keep the problem at the center. You're trying to get around the problem. Whereas the only way past the problem is through the problem. It's not like, it's why what is to be done? The first fo footnote in Lenin's What is to be done is that the revisionist dispute is going to be the means by which the revolution is going to happen. This division that has occurred, like following the logic of this division is going to lead to European revolution. And so for my memory, but also for anyone who hasn't read it, your uh, analysis of the contradictions of the millennial left in your The Millennial Left is Dead piece, um, what, what are those contradictions? Well, that's less about the contradiction. That's more at the end of the process. But earlier on, but, you know, in other words, they succumbed to the contradiction, if you will, or they avoided the contradiction by joining the Democrats. Okay, and you're talking about... Uh, and by the, the way, Jac that's the only alternative to Lenin. You're talking about the the, Jac the Jacobin people, like Basu Tunk yeah. Tunkara and all them. Okay. And everybody. I mean, look, they're all Democrats, ultimately, even Noam Chomsky. Sure, yeah, totally. And and, and, right, and, so and, is... and everybody who just saw, you know, 2020 onwards, there was, there were, as far as, you know, content creators online goes, there were the ones who basically dropped out um, after Bernie did, or there were the people who just really got down on that blue, vote blue, no matter who Biden, 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 uh, banned. Oh yeah. Anti-Trumpism was a killer. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote what I did about Trump. You know, I didn't see Trump coming and you know, Trump is not like what I would choose, but I knew that anti-Trumpism was going to be the death of the millennial left. I knew that that was going to be the huge blackmail that would be irresistible. And to their credit, by the way, we mentioned, you know, Bhaskar Sankara, Jacobin DSA. To their credit, they've been light on the anti-Trumpism. In other words, they've been pretty circumspect about it. They haven't, like, laid the emphasis there. And that's because they, there's a certain wisdom. They know that that's a trap, right? They know that that's, like, a right-wing logic of the Democratic Party to be anti-Trump. Like, have that be your priority. 
they understand that that concedes to the right wing of the Democratic Party. Now, so you're, you're saying that they understand that, but could you elaborate on why that is the case, why that is a trap, and why that is the right wing of the Democratic Party? Oh, because anti-Trumpism is all about identity politics, and that is the right wing of the Democratic Party. Meaning, they know this, Bernie knows this, um, you know, everybody knows this. Uh, like, the squad are not as clear about that. In other words, I think the squad tries to fudge the difference. You know, and, you know, Bernie rhetorically had to say that Trump was the most racist, sexist, homophobic president ever, which was laughable. Yeah. Obviously, Trump was not that. And his administration was not that. Um, but they had to say that in order to basically they were trying to capture the right wing of the Democratic Party for their purposes. Something more socioeconomically progressive. Which is not at all socialism, by the way. It's, it's actually maybe the worst form of anti-socialism because it's a way of trying to uh, capture the working class for the state. Right? In other words, it's, you know, the logic of it, the logic of progressivism in the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party should be more working class based. The Democrats should rely on a working class vote. Um, and the way they think that you do that is to make the working class dependent on the state. Right. And to me, that's anti-socialist. Right. Whereas if you cut the working class off from the state, then they can vote for, for whoever. They won't have to vote Democrat. They can vote for populist Republicans or libertarians. You know, so you don't want that. You want the, the workers to support progressive capitalist policies. And how do you do that? Well, you got to give something to them. Right. And you're saying that the progressive side of the Democratic Party, that's their thing, is to give something to the workers or to ostensibly... And to turn them into the voting base. Yeah, to turn them into the voting base. And you would say someone like, that's basically just Bernie's function, as opposed to the rest of the Democrats just don't even pretend to care. Yeah, I mean, because they know that they can win elections without the workers, particularly. Meaning... They do. They've learned that, yes. They they, they have learned that. I mean, that's neoliberalism. In fact, they could probably win elections better by scapegoating workers. <laughs> They've also sure. learned that. Sure, so, sure. And Biden poking on that uh, that guy's chest at in in Denver, right? That's or I don't was that in Denver? Oh before? yeah, listen to you, man. Listen to me, man. Yeah. Or whatever. Or you're a dog-faced pony soldier, or whatever. <laughs> Didn't he like fucking went into some aphasic fugue? I, no, Biden's I, I, you, great. I usually see him when he's in such a fugue because I try to avoid the news, and so I only see the memes at this you, point. You, you, know. you see the snippets? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's really wonderful. Like, Trump, Biden, like, is just, like, too much, you know? It's, like, between the two of them. So one thing I, w- I would love to, to, to see is, like, you responding to or, or actually maybe you just want to see him respond to you. Bosch, have you ever, like, at, tuned into anything he's done? Do you know about I've Vosh? seen some things, but I'm not a consistent viewer, no. So, Did you see um, the Vosh turn from Bernie populism to shaming and humiliating or, or like scapegoating people, workers who were dis- disaffected by the Democratic Party who weren't going to go for Biden? Oh, no. Okay. Okay, so for the, for me, that was like a turning point, like a, a, a moment of clarity because my, my position was not people need to protest the Democratic Party and my position was not – Right, right. And my position right. was not people need to vote for the Democratic Party. My position I take to be a, a more principled old left position, which is just don't don't you dare try to tell a disaffected person that their interests are genuinely represented here by the Democrats. We need and then, independence from the Democratic Party. Independence. What that means is independence from capitalist politics. And, you know, I mean, I'll just point some things out. Please. Right. A socialist position on all sorts of issues would be sometimes more Democrat inclined and sometimes more Republican inclined, right? So socialists defend gun rights. And that's, the Republicans have taken that up in their own way. They're not particularly consistent about it either. Sure. And the Democrats want to like pretend that, I don't know, maybe after 20 years when all the existing guns break down, then... Only the Yakuza will have guns. 
you know, only like, I don't know, uh, MS-13 and, you know, will have guns because hopefully the black gangs won't have guns anymore because somehow they won't be able to get them from neighboring states. Well, some shit. Like, you know, like, I don't know what fantasy they're living in, right? Right. Um, but also we can 3d print guns now out in the woods. So it's like, you know, (laughs) they, they're acting like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Go on. But you won't be able to get bullets. You know, that with a gun, like it's not the gun. It's the bullet. That, that is harder to get. The bullet's the weapon. (laughs) Yeah. No, the bullet's the weapon. And if you got shit bullets, it doesn't matter whether you have a good gun. I mean, it's also, if you have a bad gun, it doesn't matter if you have good bullets, but the bullet is the weapon, right? And actually, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So they'll just make it into a black market or whatever, you know, and they'll just, I mean, look, gun control is just the pits. It just criminalizes gun possession, which means that if cops see a gun, they can shoot you. Right. That's it. Right. Right. So let's not have any illusions about that. That's all that it is. And- well, and for me, it's like yeah, I I think when when leftists throw out the baby in the bathwater of the bourgeois revolutions, that there's something very dangerous. Yeah, and that totally. the, and that when John Locke, and that I think that John Locke is correct in basically everything he says in his second treatise on government, also his first treatise. But we don't have yeah. to we don't have to think about the arguments in the first treatise because nobody believes that the king is like literally a descendant of Adam. So we don't need to right, think about right. that treatise. Uh-huh. But right. what we do think about the second treat, everything he says there is still valid today. And so for a, for a leftist who acts like it's not, and we can just throw that out, it's like, well, fuck, guys. And then they want to try to act like guns are about hunting, where it's like, first of all, yeah, some guys need to go blow off some steam by hunting. I don't doubt, I don't doubt that some guys need to go do that. And in fact, some more guys probably need to go do that. But you know, it's not about hunting. It's about hunting. being able to defend yourself from tyranny, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's that. But, you know, more fundamentally, it's self-defense. Meaning the police are not going to protect your life. No. They're not there for that. They're law enforcement. They come to collect your body after you're dead. Yeah, by the time they show up, it's too late. Anybody who acts... And then and then obviously, like, they also might just show up and then not intervene, like it just happened with that one shooting that, you know... Well, because they're not obligated to risk their lives. They're not. Yeah, so... They're not troops in war. Now, this is a nice rabbit trail, but where, where it branches from is when, when you said... But you said, see Lenin. Lenin you, is smiling. Everything that we just said, Lenin loves. Yeah, and Satan Revolution was a great book. It's too bad he recanted on it. He did not! What are you talking about? He would never have recanted on Satan Revolution. He called it anarcho-syndicalist. And in the, in, Lenin? No. In Satan Revolution, in Satan Revolution, he argues for a Soviet structure, all, Soviets, all, all power to the Soviets... Yes. After the fact, he goes, wait a minute, there's too many Mensheviks on these Soviets. Fuck that. It's all power to the bullshit. Okay, so now we can get into the real history, Dave. Please do. Please do. I need this. Okay, yeah. because this Clearly. is this is the real deal. Um, all right, so I will put it to you this way. So let's say, okay, I'm a socialist, I'm a Marxist. And let's say that I wanted to run for elected office. And let's say that I decided that my interpretation of socialism or Marxism, or like, let's say, let's put the socialism and Marxism, let's say I'm an anarchist, right? And I, I want to run for office for some reason, you know, just as sabotage or something. And you, you know that you take any position in elected office, you have to swear allegiance to the US Constitution, right? Now, the Mensheviks, excluded themselves from the Soviets because they said they didn't support the constitutional legitimacy of the Soviets, which means that they could not take office as delegates in the Soviets. They were not excluded by the Bolsheviks. They excluded themselves. I mean, that is a fundamental thing. And you also have to understand that they still published their newspapers. They still operated in labor unions. They still operated in civil society. So you can't conflate different periods of history. And, you know, so if you're looking at like St. Petersburg or Moscow, if you're looking about like Russia, 
in other words, if you're not looking at Mensheviks behind the lines of white armies, like in Georgia, mm. you know, if you're looking at the right socialist revolutionaries, the left socialist revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, some non-party affiliated socialists and anarchists, they, they were not excluded a priori. It was only, do you support Soviet rule as a legitimate form of government. So the left socialist revolutionaries and the Bolsheviks said yes, and everyone else said no. They excluded themselves. But it was a two-party state, you should know that. The October Revolution is two parties. It's actually three parties if you think about it, because some Mensheviks do support it. That's Trotsky's Mensheviks. Okay. So it's Trotsky and what was called like uh, the Petersburg Metropolitan Socialists or something. So there's like thousands of people um, who are Mensheviks who do join the October Revolution. Um, they eventually joined the Bolshevik Party because there was no basis for them to have a separate party. Um, you know, they agreed. But the left socialist revolutionaries are another party. Right? So they, they do... It's a two-party state. And of course, if the Mensheviks... And even if some right socialist revolutionaries, if they had said, yes, we believe that the Soviets should be the legitimate government and not the provisional government, they would have been free to join. There was no excluding them. They excluded themselves. And the left socialist revolutionaries excluded themselves later when they launched a civil war against the Bolsheviks against the Brest-Litovsk Treaty because they thought the Bolsheviks were selling out Russia to the Germans. And so they immediately blew up Bolshevik headquarters in Moscow, killing hundreds of people, and tried to shoot Lenin and Trotsky and other people. Mm. But that's when Lenin had his assassination attempt. So that's that. In other words, how did it become a one-party state? That's how it happened. People excluded themselves. And this is the moment of the ban on factionalism. No, that's later. This, so so the he, ban gets on shot, faction, he gets shot. The, the, 1918. Just, the way people talk about it is that he gets shot, and then everything kind of goes down into super defensive mode. And no, no, no. That's when the Cheka not, goes crazy. It's not as simple as that. Well, the Cheka, yeah, it's like it has to respond to the terrorist threat of the left socialist revolutionaries. And you need to know who these people were. They're Narodniks. They're also anti Semites, by the way, they're Russian nationalists. They think that capitalism is Judaism. I don't wave think, my hand like that because I don't care about anti-Semitism. I wave my hand like that because every time I talk to anybody who's into politics or history, is always like, and the people I don't like, they were anti-Semites. I'm always like, okay. But it's also just true, right? So it's just the, the case. And, you know, we have, to, we have to understand what was going on there. Um, you know, even people like Plekhanov and Vera Sasulich, like... They thought that the Bolsheviks taking power through the October Revolution was like an offense against the Russian nation. And they, they even used some anti-Semitic language themselves. And they, they definitely should have known better. But, you know, I mean, this is long before the Holocaust. So it's, you know, it's a different kind of rhetorical environment. I mean, there is a history of violent anti-Semitism in Russia, of course with pogroms, etc. So it's no joke. Right, right. But it's not immediately Nazism, right, in the same way. But it, it's, it's a serious problem, right? And what we're talking about here is the left socialist revolutionaries believe in the propaganda of the deed. They believe in things like assassination and bombings as a means of taking power politically. And you understand that Marxists don't, right? Like, Lenin does not think that that's how the working class takes power. The working class doesn't take power through assassination and bombings. It's right? Through organizing, but, right. But the left socialist revolutionaries do believe that. They believe the way you get rid of a bad government is to assassinate and bomb, not organizing the working class. Right? Yeah. So this is real. I mean, that's terrorism. That's what Lenin calls terrorism. And it's not terrorism because it's not aimed at like killing like innocent civilians the way terrorism today is. Because we deal with fascist terrorism now, right? We're talking about old-style terrorism, which means assassinating political enemies. Which, 
again, it's effective to a certain extent, but it doesn't help the working class organize. So it right? is, is, is the word the same when it's translated? Is the, is the word for how you're talking about terror then the same word that Trotsky is using? And then is there a significant point of disagreement between Trotsky and Lenin when it comes to his communism and terrorism? No, it's the same. Same concept. And so, so the meaning that Lenin would be against Trotsky's position on terror. No, it's it's terror. Okay, so there's terrorism and there's terror, right? Because, so in other words, for for anyone yeah. who's just watching and doesn't know what I'm talking about, because obviously like a lot of people haven't done this reading or whatever, but it's like Trotsky's basically like, well, Trotsky wants to call me, wants to call what we're doing terror. Fucking right, it's terror, and we're gonna do a lot more terror, bitches. Like that's the summary of the whole book. Okay. All right. So that's okay. So there are a couple of things that work here. Okay. One is, uh, let's let's trace. So since you brought this up, I'll I'll start to weave this in. Um, you know, Lenin's notorious for saying, you know, that, you know, in the villages, like exploitative landowners and notorious revolutionaries and Russian Orthodox priests should be lynched. Yeah, and then laughing about it because Bertrand Russell makes that. There's a right. video where Russell talks about that or whatever. So, but check this out. The peasants were doing that anyway. In other words, what Lenin wanted was for that spontaneous action by the peasants in the countryside to identify itself with the socialist revolution. Sure. In and, other and, words... And I think a lot of people, whether they're Leninists or not, will say that the peasants were actually a step ahead of a lot of these Bolsheviks and that they were already doing all of these things and Lenin's thing was just to try to integrate them. I'm not, I'm not saying that, no, no, I'm not saying that because they weren't ahead. In some ways, they're simply behind. If you look at what, and they're backward, I mean, they are. What Lenin called that, if you look at his writings on the Irish uprising, the Easter uprising of 1916, he calls it petty bourgeois outrages. Meaning, he says, in any revolution, there's going to be petty bourgeois outrages, and you can't get freaked out by them. In other words, like, popular violence. Right. He calls it petty bourgeois outrages. He says, you can't get freaked out by them, you can't reject them. He says, of course, that's not how you achieve socialism, but also, that's just going to happen. Right? When government authority breaks down, people take things into their own hands, and people are going to do things. Right. And that's that. Like, that's just a fact of life. I think Trotsky talks about this in the history of the Russian Revolution. He says in a revolution, the masses take the stage of history. And whether that's a good or a bad thing is a question for moral philosophers. But it's just a fact. Right. So, of course, like Marxists are not going to be like, oh, yes, people should engage in mob violence and neighbors should start killing each other out of old resentments, right? Like, that's not, that has nothing to do with socialism. Will that happen in a revolution? Yeah. And let's just hope it doesn't, like, disorganize the revolution. And so how do you not let it disorganize the revolution? By saying, we support you. Right? Because the Bolsheviks couldn't have stopped it even if they wanted to. Right? If the Bolsheviks... Try, you know, tried to go to the countryside and say, peasants, don't kill your landlords, don't kill the priests, don't kill each other. Let's just take a chill pill and we're going to work it methodically and we're going to socialize the economy over the course of decades. They would have just lynched the Bolsheviks. Right. Right. Which so is they why said, if you were a socialist doing, running today, right. which is why you were, if you were a socialist running today, you probably wouldn't look at the people who drive around with their, with the flags on their trucks and the guns and say, you're all terrible people, you'd actually No, have to... you just gotta let it, like, in other words, it's like, look, it's it's like riots, right? Let's look, let's talk about, like, the George Floyd protests and the riots, right? Yeah. It's like, riots are not good, riots are not class struggle, riots are not revolutionary or socialist. They're not. They're just not particularly good. At the same time, socialists are not gonna, like, make their priority denouncing riots, yeah. You know, because, you know, there's a certain, like, justification, logic, justice, something. You know, it's just not, especially if it's like looting stores and stuff, it's like, this is just not, like, you don't want to say this is, like, 
a revolution and it, look at how great it is. You, you don't want to do that, but you don't want to say, oh, that's like horrible. People are being violent because they're smashing windows or something. Right. And of course you want to say if they like, if people are hurt, that's like really unfortunate. That's not good. And of course, under the guise of a popular uprising, like inflamed by the passions of a political moment, under the guise of that, all sorts of criminal stuff is going to happen. And you do want to say there's criminality. You don't want to say criminality is revolutionary. Right? Which like, a lot of not. people in 2020 were. You know? Yeah, and antisocial behavior is antisocial behavior. Like, you just don't, you just don't, right? Like, you just don't mistreat people. You don't. Yeah. Like, if you don't have to, like, engage in any kind of violence, like, to defend yourself, then you shouldn't. Right? Like, just don't right but at the same time it's not like socialists it's like the first thing that they would have to say is oh riots are bad no the first thing you'd have to say is clearly people are pissed off at police violence okay and so this is this is you kind of building up to saying something about lenin and trotsky on terror right yes and so like terror is a part of the revolution and in other words okay let's let's take a definition of terrorism let's let's do that so in the United States today, under the law, as it's defined now, right now, we can take their definition of terrorism. Their definition of terrorism is crime committed with a political purpose. This is why they can call union organizing terrorism. This is why they can call the civil rights movement terrorists. They called Martin Luther King a terrorist. And this is because why they're able to abduct and disappear people who might be involved in any kind. Yeah, right. So yeah, any kind of organizing. So if if you're breaking the law, not just a crime of opportunity or a crime of personal gain, but if you're breaking the law for a political reason, you are committing a worse crime. As far as the state is concerned. Right. The same crime, but with a political purpose is worse because you're challenging the legitimacy of the state and you're seeking to undermine the state and the state's authority. So you're creating more public danger than a normal crime would. So this 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 is the expanded definition that obviously serves like the security state now. I mean, it's it's obviously a very treacherous definition, but let's accept it. Right. So how do you deal with that? You deal with that by recognizing to be a socialist or a communist or a Marxist and to engage in the organizing necessary of the working class to take political power one day, you have to understand you're putting your life at risk because you're going to be treated as a terrorist. Sure, sure. Okay, well, that's why we have to be really organized. We have to be organized enough to protect ourselves against the state like just to cover ourselves i want to like, denounce oh, really quick it. just as a disclaimer i want to denounce terror not only the terror of like lynching your landlord but i also want to go and this will just obviously piss off a lot of people who want to be uppercase r revolutionaries in my chat but look i do not think there's any feasibility to having a political movement right now that embraces terrorism and even if it made sense for Lenin and if you don't agree with this you can go ahead and stipulate how you don't agree with it but let me make my right. statement I, don't, I just don't think it's feasible if it was feasible they walked into the Winter Palace they fucking walked into it they didn't really have to there wasn't really the need to have a, a lot fight. of violence That's there right. wasn't a lot of violence and there, the, right. the, the czar was like an incompetent moron who didn't even want to be doing what he was doing we live in a different situation now. There's not a czar in charge, right? And the, it's the you talked about it. You said, "Oh, it's the deep state." Because I was talking about the CIA, the NSA, the security state. You said it's basically the deep state. It's like, well, that is the the term that people use. I don't want to be associated with QAnon, I mean, so I'm not going to use the term. What I'm, what but basically, I'm that... basically though, there has never been a more sophisticated security apparatus in the history of humanity than we're, uh, of we're up against now. Lenin walked into the Winter Palace. We're not going to walk into shit. Well, we, we will in the end. Why? We will in the end, but we have to build ourselves to that point where we can do that. I mean, what I would say is this. Generally speaking, don't break the law. Generally speaking, like, try to avoid breaking the law. 
Sure. Now, the interesting thing there is what counts as breaking the law is going to be subject to interpretation. Sure. Right? So, like, you're trying to organize a union on company property. Are you breaking the law? Kind of. It depends on how it's interpreted, right? So you have to create, you have to have a movement strong enough to create political conditions where they're less likely to be able to interpret what you're doing as breaking the law. I mean, it, this is some Martin Luther King stuff, by the way, civil disobedience, right? Where you're pushing the envelope on what counts as breaking the law. And are you really going to enforce that law? Is it, is it going to be politically viable for you to really enforce that law as strictly as you want to? You know? You got to be so able you would to say, and you you would then say because I think impl- part of what you're saying here is just that law is what you make it, and it's about who's in power and whatever they've written on some papers. Social power, civil power, because look, corporations, civil society organizations break the law all the time. Sure, they break the law all the time. Church groups help illegal immigrants. They're breaking the law all the time. Are the police going to crack down on the churches that help illegal immigrants? Hell no, because politically it's unviable. Or, or are they going to actually crack down on the farmers who exploit that labor in the first place? No. No, hell no. That's right. right. So, again, the working class has to create its own level of civil society, social organizing. And interestingly enough, they will be able to force concessions from capitalists that the state may not like. In other words, the state might intervene and say to the capitalist, actually, you, you're, you can't make that concession to the workers. Right? But you do it behind the scenes. In other words, this is going to sound like anarchism. It really is. Because we think of socialism as like, changing the law or changing administrative policy or getting the state on your side or like an election no socialism is at the level of civil society that the law and government policy doesn't touch for political reasons they don't touch it it's like how the police accept gang control of neighborhoods right do they officially accept it no but in practice they accept it because they know that they can't arrest all the gang members and because they know that the gang keeps order in its own way. There's a tacit modus vivendi between the police and the gang. Oh, yeah. That's how it works. Socialists have to be in that kind of a position where the police don't crack down on you because in your own way, you're keeping order. In your own way, you're like channeling things in the way that they can deal with. And of course, they want to get rid of you they would get rid of you, but they kind of can't. They have to accept you. I mean, that's already how the left today functions. The left today is non-existent. It really is dead, meaning the police don't want to crack down on the left because the left doesn't has no power, zero. It's no threat whatsoever. It's a total joke. Right? Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, agree, I agree that... Okay, so your position, though, that the left is dead is, is because the left is not... Leninist. Politically, it's not a substantial, it doesn't matter whether it's Lenin. Again, what Lenin means to me is do you have the requisite social and political organization to have any kind of social power whatsoever? You know, Martin Luther King is a fucking Leninist in these terms, meaning he organized the movement that changed things. That's Leninism, right? What I'm saying is that, like, your whole split subject thing is, well, we can't, like, try to change things because that assumes that we are a subject but we're always a split subject it's like wait dave no we got to try to change things first of all i didn't say that and i also don't think mcgowan would say that you are you do because you say that marxism thinks that it can overcome the contradiction no it can over you you can overcome certain contradictions but maybe maybe they're going to give rise to other contradictions are you saying that i said that yeah about um the, the illusion that Marxism thinks that there's a contradiction that we can overcome. McCallum said that and said, no, we have to understand that we'll always be living with contradiction. And I feel like maybe, maybe not. We don't know because I, I don't I think, think I think that he was 
less sure about Marx being that kind of a teleological thinker. It, but it's undoubtedly But teleology is important. It's undoubted, un undoubtedly true that there are a lot of Marxists who operate as though all contradictions will be resolved in a revolution. Don't that throw is... out don't throw out teleology. In other words, what I would say the contradictions we experience now have not always existed. Sure. And therefore will not always exist. And you threw out is, you threw out teleology last time I had you on because you said that it's about right now and that the future doesn't exist. But tough. teleology says that the, the the future does exist and that we're on a direct course towards it. But contradiction means a task. It doesn't mean an ontology. Right? You don't have to say the contradictory nature of reality. What you have to say is, what's the contradiction that we're struggling through now? And that's what's tasking us. And in that sense, it, there's a telos, meaning this task now, capitalism, let's do it. we got to work through this contradiction. It's not about, oh, well, you know what? The nature of reality itself, quantum mechanics, shows us that everything is contradictory always. N please, no. No, 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 no. It doesn't hinge on that. It hinges on the phenomenal contradictions of this society in this historical moment, capitalism. Whether or not a dialectical contradiction has always existed, this is pre-Socratic stuff. It really is. This is Epicurus. This is the swerve. This is what Lacan and Althusser are based on. Right? So, I mean, I, I don't... Adam's falling through space, intersecting, creating new worlds, Alain Badu, right? All this stuff... We don't need that. We really don't. Like, that's interesting. Like, philosophically, yes, please think about that. But the struggle for socialism doesn't depend on whether that's true or not. Two things. One is a statement. The other one's a question. And the question is going to be about what that looks like or what it needs to be based on, socialism. Because I would like to stick to socialism in this conversation. Mm -hmm. The other thing is just mm -hmm. to say, uh, I'd asked McGowan and you both, if you wanted to have that opportunity to have a conversation about this and then you'd both said, yeah, and you had said yes, but, mm -hmm. and your, your, but had been that you also want to be able to clarify your position on the political necessity of political Marxism. Um, and so obviously Which is what we're what, doing now. That's what we're doing now. And I, so obviously McGowan will have to watch this conversation and then we'll be able to have and a conversation it's about coherent enough, you know, and systematic enough watchable. I <laughs> hope so. I hope, yeah. well, I hope that all this stuff that we do ultimately is, uh, there's this whole, this is, this, my fear is that people will watch our conversation, they come with their preconceived idea of what yes. they believe, and that they walk away with that only further affirmed, but they've not actually got any critical that, distance or thought I on hope the matter. That I'm able to throw enough curveballs to get people to think a little bit. All right. So we were talking about terror. Well, you're we were definitely talking about... getting me to think. So I don't know about the rest of these people, but it'll work for me. Thank you. Yeah. Good. I mean, so we we're talking about the peasants would have been lynching the landlords and the local priests anyway, and they might have been killing each other justly or unjustly anyway. Because, you know, in a revolution, you might go and kill your neighbor for sleeping with your wife because the cops aren't around. Sure, right? sure, sure. I mean, and that's I would. not revolutionary. I would. <laughs> but it's not revolutionary. No, that's not, but that's not revolutionary. That's not no, like, not. you know, uh, you know, advancing the cause for socialism. So it's going to be like when there's a breakdown, right, in society, in politics, in, in if the government has a breakdown, all sorts of shit is going to happen. That's unavoidable. That's not like desirable. It's not like, yeah, bring it on. I love that shit. It's more like, you know what? Capitalism is going to do that. And we got to be ready to just accept that it's not all going to be just. There's going to be a lot of crime. That's actually crime that socialists would not support, right? Uh, you know, in the 1905 revolution in Russia, the peasants rose up against the czar. They went and killed Jews. That's not good. It's part of the revolution. It's not good. What the Bolsheviks do, they organize working class militias to defend the Jews. Yeah, but they didn't That's do that for the did. landlords in this case. And in a lot of cases, they didn't right. do it for the richer peasants either. Right. That's right. And, you know, it's not because Lenin's bloodthirsty. It's because he had to pick his battles, for Christ's sake. And he had to, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, it is politics. 
And the priority had to be keeping the peasants on side, but really keeping the workers in power. And of course, that, that latter part is the part that fell apart, right? That's the part that, you know, we don't know. Like, we know that the workers can make a revolution in, you know, the most advanced capitalist cities of a mostly peasant country. Right? Like, the lesson of the Russian Revolution is that a socialist organized working class can overthrow the government and start to establish its own political power. We don't know whether that will create the actual dictatorship of the proletariat, the total appropriation by the working class of capital. We don't know. We actually don't know, because that would happen, that would need to happen internationally. We're not sure about these things. But, you know, we know some things. We know from the Paris Commune, we know from the 1905 Russian Revolution, we know from the 1917 Russian Revolution, we know a bit from the German Revolution and the Hungarian Revolution, and from Italy in 1919, 1920, you know, Northern Italy. We know some things, we do know some things. And we know some things also from the experience a little bit later on in the 20s and 30s and after World War II briefly. There are, there's some evidence that the working class organized for socialism can take political power. Do we know that it leads beyond capitalism to socialism? We don't. We do not know that. Not at all. And what we do know is that capitalism is going to produce massive social crises and breakdowns and often those will lead to political breakdowns overthrowing the government and we do know that there have been times when the workers have risen in that context so we know that revolution is going to happen there will be a revolution in the united states one day whether it's a fascist revolution or not or a socialist revolution, or just some, like, capitalist political coup. Who knows, right? There was a revolution. There was a civil war in the United States. That was a revolution, right? So there there has already been these things. And your, the your position, and I, uh, maybe this is more of like mm -hmm. a platypus proposition, but I think, is this also your position, would be that the American Revolution is an ongoing revolution, and that... The Civil War was a stage in that ongoing revolution, and that so you believe that there will be a continuation of that ongoing revolution, right? Well, hopefully. I mean, what I would say is this. Capitalism is a revolutionary society. It comes out of the bourgeois revolution, and the bourgeois revolution is not over. Yeah. And the bourgeois, won't, the bourgeois revolution won't be over until the socialist revolution is over, meaning the socialist revolution comes out of that same revolutionary energy that is in our social relations. So our social relations in this society are revolutionary. Just wait one sec. Okay, we're well, reconnecting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the opportunity to close my blinds since the sun's coming in. Okay, for sure. You do that. And can you hear me while you're doing it? I can still hear you, yes. Okay, because we're so, back. We're back. Are we back? Okay, hold on. Hold on one second. Don't worry, chat. I paused myself, and Chris took the opportunity to close his blinds because it was too bright. Because the sun's coming in. But give me one second, Dave. Just one for second. sure, for sure. So, I mean, Chris knows what I was saying because we already had this conversation. But for anybody who missed it, the point is, is that the idea, the bourgeois idea of private property is contradicted between personal property and means of production and that these are not the same thing and that leftists were keen on that but that just because that's a contradictory notion doesn't mean that the the base part of what Locke was getting at is therefore wrong it's no i mean he's still well right. Locke is there but let's not leave it at Locke meaning Rousseau has a critique of Locke that was influential for Thomas Jefferson and it's why we have life liberty and the pursuit of happiness rather than life liberty and property because Jefferson said property is not an end in itself, but only a means to an end. And we need property rights now for our freedom, but in the future, we may not. And so we shouldn't enshrine it as an inalienable right. We don't have an inalienable right to a means to an end of freedom, but only to the end of freedom. 
right? That's why it's the pursuit of happiness. Him and Benjamin Franklin came up with that phrase to modify the Lockean life, liberty, and property. And where did they get that from? Rousseau. Mm. Rousseau, right? Um, in other words, Rousseau famously said, you know, property is theft in his own way. Um, that's Proudhon. But Rousseau said something very similar. He did. But he also said that property was necessary. Oh, Rousseau said right. that property is necessary. Yeah, in, in his moment, he said, you know, when property was established, it was a usurpation. But when it was established, history up to that point probably made it necessary. Mm. Right. Civil society, bourgeois society, in the way that we understand it, came about as a necessity. And we just shouldn't, you know, leave it fixed at that. Right. So, again, there was an idea already in the 1700s that property is a means to an end that arose historically and that might be transitory, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't always need it. We might need it now, but we may not always need it. Now, they probably wouldn't have questioned labor in the same way. They would have questioned the objectification of labor and property, but they probably ontologized labor. I mean, I would say that actually Kant and Hegel, maybe even Hegel more than Kant, Kind of ontologizes labor in a way that's usually blamed on um, Marx, but is Can actually you explain not what true. What do you mean Marx. by on- ontologizes labor? Well, that the essential human activity is labor. Oh. So, so, and you're saying that's a problem? It is a problem because I think that Marx, you know, um, understands that as a very bourgeois, like historically specific conception of human nature, homo right. faber, homo economicus, and, and that so, it didn't always exist and won't always exist. Right, and this is kind of why Pistone spends so much time talking about how so many Marxists seem to transhistoricize labor, but Marx was yep. not transhistoricizing it. Not, that's right. Except that but he has Hegel moments where he seems to slip and, and still do it, right? But Well, rhetorically, um, but also in our world, the horizon that we're living under, we do live under an ontology of labor. And, you know, Poston corrected himself, by the way, later in life. He said the problem with the new social movements is that they're premature post-capitalism. Premature post-capitalism. Yes. So, in other words, we do have to overcome labor before we can overcome labor, meaning we can't just declare it to be over. We can't just say, oh, no more labor. No. Socially, we have to achieve that. In other words, capitalism, what... you know, is a crisis of labor that seems to point to the supersession of labor, but we have not o- overcome it yet as a social relation. We have not. Well, no, we haven't. And so, it, it, to to uh, if that's our goal, then um, let's. This might clarify things a little bit more. Last yep. time we talked, um, I brought up the issue of forced forced labor because for me, mass internment. The suspension of civil rights, the all of the other things, the bread lines, all of these things that come to mind that people usually associate with Soviet socialism. Union. That shit's prevalent in any society in the midst of a war when it's being attacked on all sides and it needs to tighten down and get secure. I, I okay. Yeah, you there know, are I, two two periods. I think we talked about this last time. Two periods of note with respect to the Soviet experience. One is the civil war. So that's 1919-1920. The other is the five-year plan, the forced collectivization of agriculture and the crash industrialization that is necessitated by the Great Depression because they lose the ability to trade and they lose foreign investment due to the Great Depression. So the foreign investors and also people that you would trade with abroad not be, basically being out of the picture – Yep. Results in needing to roll out the NEP? Is that? Yes. Okay. And that gets us back to the ban on factions, by the way. So the ban on factions is instituted at the same time as the NEP. And the reason that Lenin calls for the ban on factions, which is not a ban on dissent, it's a ban on like stable, organized, factional dissent, is because he recognized that with the NEP, that capitalists are going to join the party. 
And so the ban on factions is part of the NEP because he realizes that with the NEP, if you still had factional life within the Bolshevik party, you would eventually have a capitalist faction. I see. And so the, the reading that you recommended me was Lenin's last struggle. And yep. I, I was working at Amazon over the weekend. <sighs> These fucking guys, they told me that I'd be able to have headphones at work and then I get the job and then they actually say, no, you can't have headphones. And so oh. I have, and my whole thing's like, I just want to just do my labor and listen to audiobooks and then write books or essays on my free time. And like, that's the, the lifestyle I'm trying to live right now. <laughs> Amazon seemed like a, a good way to go about it. And now I'm like, I'm still doing it. I'm just sneaking the earbud until I get fired. And so I haven't. That sucks. What's their rationale for that? They say it's for safety. I don't believe them. I have no idea. I think. Oh, well. But one earbud? That's... Just one. Just one? All I do is sort things from one spot into another spot. There's no one in my area, right? Like, so it's not like there's not a danger anyway. So no, it's the danger to you, meaning that it's safety and you know what they care about there is. Can you sue them? Right. And so if you get injured and you're wearing headphones and they have a rule, you can't wear headphones, then they'll say, well, the reason you got injured is because you were breaking our rule and therefore we're not liable. Right. So that's the, that's the nature of the rule. The rule is just to free them of liability. Yes, yeah, cover their ass. And like everything else, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is <clears throat> Freddie. Freddie talks about litigation culture, right? This is totally. Yeah, this that's is what not... diversity, equity, inclusion is. By the way, 100%. it's just what do corporations have to do to not get sued for racism and sexism and homophobia? It has nothing to do with actually protecting people of color and women and no. queers and trans. It has to do with what are the what boxes do the corporations have to tick to satisfy their liability insurance con exactly. right, provisions? Because they have insurance to protect them against lawsuits, but they won't get insurance from the insurers unless they do certain things so that they can defend themselves in court, right? And the government leads that way because the government doesn't care about people of color or women or anybody else. The government is just creating rules that if the corporations adopt those rules, then the corporations can say, see, we did what the government did, wanted us to do. And therefore, we're not responsible for anything bad that happens. We're just That's where the COVID restrictions come from, too. Uh, 100%. It's liability for the corporations. It's if the corporations follow the government rules, then they can't be sued for spreading COVID at work. Right. That's right. all that it is. Yeah. And I figure that's all that it is about with this Amazon thing too. And I, I mean, and I like the, the, I think I, the longest I've gone without an earbud in was like four hours and it was the worst. It was the worst. But anyway, so I've been working through uh -huh. Lennon's last struggle. I got two thirds of the way through it and cool. My impression of this so far is it's a sympathetic treatment of Lenin in his last days, mostly like the last year. Basically, you know, I think that there's like this inherent sort of like idea that uh, it's never quite said, but it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he being poisoned? How much were the doctors working with Stalin? They were to some degree. We know that. And so, but yeah, he's and, and what, what why but the was, political issues? What, what was he struggling with Stalin over? So he didn't want this ban on factionalism to last forever. <laughs> yes. And he did and he wanted uh the NAP to be defended. And yes. uh what were the other issues here? Can you help me out? He also didn't want the Russians to dominate the Soviet Union. Oh right. And so there was a there, That's a big the, one. The nationalism question was a really big one That's as well a big for one. him, which was how do we respect national autonomy but also do a Soviet Union Yep. Right. So this is a hard line to walk. Yeah. That's yeah. a big one though. That that might be the biggest one of the of them. For him. And because especially since Stalin's the socialism in one country and get back to work, we've already achieved socialism. You're represented now, worker. That 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 that's a very important point, right? Again, to think about where that comes from in Lenin. Yeah. You know, uh, it doesn't come from sentimentality. It comes from 
his political principles and what are his political principles, they're about advancing the cause of socialism, right? And international socialism and world socialism, dictatorship of the proletariat, actual ability to overcome capitalism, right? Which he thought Stalin was undermining. So... It's not like a good form of socialism versus a bad form of socialism, right? It's not like authoritarian socialism versus libertarian socialism. Authoritarian socialism is not socialism at all because it's actually preventing the advance of socialism, right? Again, from a Marxist perspective, if the working class is not appropriating the means of production and transforming capitalism into socialism, then it's not happening. Right. So anything that prevents the working class from doing that or that concedes to the reality of the working class failing to do that, because maybe you could say that's what Stalin is, that he didn't prevent the workers from doing it, that he just institutionalized the workers own failure to do it. But even if it's the latter, it sets a bad example. Right, because then we get this idea that like, oh, okay, state bureaucrats can kind of do socialism depending on which policies they adopt, right? And then you get some kind of Bernie AOC, Jack and DS, DSA nonsense of like mm-hmm. gradual socialism through state policy. It's like this that's bring, never going to be This brings us back case. to the, if you could sit down Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson yep. and lay out this proposition for them. I mean, part of the, Issue maybe they would frame. say you would you want to put the workers in power, but what will really happen is some bureaucrats will, will take power. Well, and if they if, here's the other thing is if if any of them thought, hey, that'll keep me in power, they'd probably go for it. But obviously, they're not going. It's not going to be. Yeah. Re, it's not going to be a real dictatorship of the proletariat. It'll be that's one of right. The, it'll be Teddy Roosevelt saying, "I'm the supreme leader now of the proletariat. What's up, everybody?" <laughs> right, like he would right. happily, he would happily forego, you know, Congress and 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 the Supreme Court, and just have his, you know. Well, you know, in the United States, and this is why I said what I said earlier about like, if I ran for office, I'd have to swear allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Well, you know, in other words, I'm not. I don't think that socialists would have to refuse to do that. So the old Socialist Party of America, Eugene Debs, they ran for office. And they swore allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. They also had in their program a goal of changing the U.S. Constitution. But their goal to change the Constitution was going to be through the Constitution. Right? They were going to use constitutional means to change the Constitution. Now, they were excluded from office actively by the capitalist state because what the what the state said was that they weren't a legitimate political party because the state in the United States defines political parties as voters. They said, no, you are a membership organization. The Socialist Party is a membership organization, which means that your candidates are not going to listen to the voters, but they're going to listen to your membership organization. And that means you're not a legitimate party. That's some bullshit right there, right? So, because, you know, that's why people will say the Democrats and the Republicans aren't really parties, because anyone can call themselves whatever and run for office, and if they get the votes, they win, right? So they're not really parties. Like, you'll hear leftists crap out of line. It's no problem. Right? It's not a real party. It's like, okay, sure, there's no party discipline with the Republicans and the Democrats, whereas a socialist party would require party discipline and that would immediately create problems for us being elected to office. But check it out. Socialists back then did not think that socialism depended upon being elected to office. They thought that that would be part of the struggle, ancillary, in the same way Lenin thought running for elections is good and useful. But it's not like the thing. The thing it was, is it was always kind classes. of like a promotional act, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. It's just it's just a signal boost, really. It's just a, you know, it, it, well, and I think did it, didn't Mark say like regardless of whether you're going to win or not, you run just to get your idea, you know, to so that people know yeah. you have a position, right? Yes. And what they did, what the SPD did in the Reichstag was that they got up and gave crazy speeches in which they kind of expanded their philosophy on this and that. 
like Babel gave like a four hour speech on the history of homosexuality and why it should be, it should be decriminalized. Oh, oh, that's yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he gave another one that he wrote a book out of about like the history of the oppression of women. So they would do shit like that and then they'd vote no on everything. OK, OK. You know, because even something that they might support, they were like, yeah, but we don't want the capitalist state to do it. It's like this person who runs every year for governor uh, in, in, in the state of Idaho. Um, and, and this person changed his name legally to pro-life. And so... Oh, no. He just, I thought you were going to say the person who changed his, um, his name to the rent is too damn high. Do you remember that guy? <laughs> I didn't that, know that guy was fucking great. Like the rent is too damn high and breakfast, lunch and dinner. Right. Nice. And the white gloves and everything like that. That was a high point of American politics right there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I was, that, that, that's definitely a higher point than running it with your name as pro-life. But, you know, but check it out. That's what Bernie did for many years. So Bernie, I think, was elected to Congress in 1983 or something in the Reagan era. And for many years, that's what he used to do. He used to give speeches in Congress that nobody listened to. Right. And then he shocked everyone by winning significant primary votes in 2016. But, you know, again, I would never have known that Bernie was coming at all. Right. Uh, uh, who knows? Like, you know, um, where that comes from, what that's about. But it, it captures a moment, right? Um, but so the socialists, you know, they used to do stuff like that. Um, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat is obviously a different proposition. Than what Bernie's doing, you're saying. Very different. Well, of course. Um, and, you know, but again, getting back to Lenin and, and, and the supposed, like, repressive character of, of Le Lenin, it's the repressive character of revolution. You know, and again, it's not like we have our choice of dictatorship or democracy. We don't. We only have the choice of capitalist dictatorship or socialist dictatorship. Now, obviously, there are a million varieties of that, meaning obviously it's better to live today in the United States under this capitalist dictatorship than it was to live under Hitler's dictatorship. Right. Yes, but it's still a capitalist dictatorship. Let's let's not kid ourselves. And it's a real dictatorship, meaning they arrest their political enemies, like they're arresting Trump people left and right with SWAT teams. You know, uh, this is a capitalist dictatorship. It's a Bonaparte state dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, but not really. It's more like a dictatorship, kind of for the bourgeoisie, but no billionaire is safe. And, and just no, to help you Elon clarify Musk your position, the, 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 to help you clarify your position and tie into what you were saying about parties a minute ago, the this is not a socialist need to run as a third party proposition. It's no to organize and and actually put out of business Democrats and Republicans as parties. Eventually, eventually, that's like an end game. The growth of a socialist party on the ground level in civil society will produce a crisis of the capitalist parties, whether or not socialists run for office in elections, because they're going to have to be negotiating with socialists at the level of labor unions, at the level, level of other kind of uh, social groups, organizing, community organizations. When you look back to the time of like the SPD in Germany, they had women's organizations, youth organizations, labor unions, other kinds of workers' social organizations. They had working class sports clubs, uh, working class music clubs. I mean, they were just a force in the working class at every level. And that's why you said, you know, Christian fundamentalists. They did what churches do. And that's why they were called disparagingly by people who were like too too cool for school, like intellectuals. They were like, oh, yeah, socialism, that's the church of the working class. Mm. No, really? Yes, absolutely. For real. It's yeah, got to well, be I'd, like I'd, I'd go to a church like that. Uh, you know, fair enough. 
And the point is not to substitute like Marxism for theology, right? Because again, it was a political movement in a way well, that religious groups are kind of not. Well, and it becomes this scholastic sort of thing once you've got the fully bureaucratized machine um, in the wake of Lenin's death, right? Yes. For you, you would agree to that, right? I mean, what I would say is this. The Communist Party before Lenin's death and after Lenin's death, there's a huge difference. And it's not because Lenin died, because he's out of, out of commission for a couple of years at the end. So it's a gradual process that happens through the 1920s. But one of the ways that it happens is the expansion of the membership. So it starts off a small party of a few hundred thousand people, and it quadruples in size within a few years after Lenin's death. And where does that come from? A lot of it comes from the working class, it does, but a lot of it comes from the state bureaucracy. So basically, bureaucrats in the state, in order to retain their position, have to join the party. Now, what's interesting is that former enemies of the Bolsheviks politically also joined the party. So I always like to point out in the purge trials of the 1930s, the lead prosecutor of Stalin's opponents among the Bolsheviks, the old Bolsheviks, the lead prosecutor was a Menshevik who joined the party in the 20s after Lenin's death. Okay. So they liquidated so, the party, is what I'm saying. They they completely liquidated it. In other words, rather than having a multi-party Soviet democracy, which is the way they should have gone, they went for a party state, in which to be a state functionary, you had to be a party member, which was not true in Lenin's time. Right? There was a non-identity of the bureaucracy and the party. It was understood that the state is actually against the working class. And that the party can't, like, absorb the state without the party being absorbed by the state. So this time I'm left at fault. <laughs> Same. Well, it's already back. It's cool. It just disconnects and then it reconnects, but it takes about 30 seconds, I think. So I, I suspect we're back at this point. Okay. Yeah, we, we're good. So, so the process by which Stalinism happens, so I, it doesn't how happen do you, from, so, doesn't yeah, happen let me from just Stalin's put the question, bad Let me idea. put the question to you, and mm -hmm. then I'm going to mute myself and step away for a second while I'm listening still, but I'll let you kind of have the floor here. So the question that is on everybody's mind, unless they've, they think they've already got to figure it out, is how do you keep – even if we agree that Lenin – was based and had it all figured out, or at least was doing the right thing and had the right motives and, and made a lot of good choices. Um, how do you keep this approach from turning into Stalinism? And, and then I would, I would just simply stipulate also, if you're trying to speak to American workers, you know, and, and it does seem like you take the American Oops. tradition of revolution seriously because you do take American workers seriously. How do you keep the, I might have to reset my router if it does this much more. So hold on oh, one boy. sec. Let's give it just a couple seconds here. And you you got to go in like uh, 15, 20 minutes? 15 minutes or so, yeah. So let, let me just answer the first part of the question, which is how do, you, how do you keep it from turning into Stalinism? There are no guarantees. In other words, if the revolution fails, it fails. And if it fails, it's going to take some form. And the form that it took in the Soviet Union was Stalinism. And there are no guarantees here. There are none. Like, not at all. There's no, like, cure-all solution. What there is, is, again, for me, why Lenin's an important historical figure, is he built the party that was able to affect some kind of working class taking power in Russia in 1917. Um, he's part of a larger movement in the Second International before that takes place. And the other people who he worked with, like people like Rosa Luxemburg, were also involved in the revolutionary process outside of Russia that also failed. But these were people who participated in a movement that was able to organize the working class adequately to a certain extent for social and political power 
they also thought about what they were doing and they reflected on it and their writings are a way of raising the issues and problems that manifested in that movement. So it's not a straight shot. It's not like, okay, if we just do it this way, it's a straight shot to socialism. No. It's good Actually, to the, success of the, the success of the movement creates new problems, right? And why do you need Marxism? You don't need Marxism for its philosophy, other than as a critical philosophy, if you will. Sure. As a way of reflecting on how the attempt to change the world is part of the world that it is trying to change. Even when it seems very distant from that world. In other words, the, the socialists of the Second International were a persecuted bunch of people, very alienated from society. The working class was very subordinated, right? A lot of what it had to do organizationally was underground, was not officially recognized was illegal, right? Even when it appears to be operating in its own world, the church of the working class over here, separate from official society, it's part of one singular reality, capitalism. Well, I would right? add that without Marx, and I think that I would, I would, if it's someone just read Lenin onwards and, or really stayed there, but they, they're not reading capital. Marx, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that they would, come to the realization that I yes. think is the essential realization, which is that these tendencies to make the working day longer and more intensive and to abolish the weekend and to not pay people fairly are all just downstream from a fundamental problem that needs to be overcome completely. That is not going to be solved by just paying people, people better and shortening yes. the working day. And it's yes. not going to be solved by unions and it's not going to be solved yes. by representation in government either. That's right. And, so interestingly, the, the Industrial Revolution itself, for Marx, is driven by the workers' own struggle. In other words, it's not just, oh, well, the capitalists respond to the workers' demands with technology. It's a very complicated process of society in which industrialization is driven by the workers' own struggle. The workers' struggle deepens the contradiction of capitalism, which can sound a little mystical and can sound even moral in nature, but actually it has more of a structural component to it, which is that it actually drives the contradiction between labor and capital, between wage labor and capital more deeply. The degree to which the workers are successful in their struggle um, and of course, a high expression of this is the socialist movement itself. So Marx understood the Industrial Revolution beginning in England to be something that is driven by and accelerated by the workers' own successful struggle for shortening the working day. Mm -hmm. Right? For example. And that that displaces the problem to other areas, whether other sectors of the working class in England or it starts to create Germany as a low-wage country, where they move literally, like just as Engels is from Germany and his family is invested in Manchester, the English capitalists also shift their capital to Germany because they can pay workers less there. Right. And in Parliament, liberals say, well, if we give the workers too much, then the capitalists will just move to Germany. These issues have been here for a long time. Well, and people in the chat are saying that all of my quote unquote arguments, I don't know if I have an, a coherent position <laughs> right. to be arguing from. I, I think I'm raising common sense, you know, things uh -huh. that you should respond to is all, but the, all my arguments have been here since before the second international and it's all just being repeated. And it's like, well, then I think that Marx just would be better by now at, 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 at preempting and addressing these. If these are so, no, fucking ob if these are so them. fucking yeah. obvious people in the chat, why haven't you fucking figured it out already? <laughs> Come on. But I mean, we can I'm not saying you're having a problem re responding to my questions. I'm saying, but right. this is people, this is like a tired old thing that comes with whenever I have these kinds of conversations, people are like, well, this has all been said already. Yeah. Well, uh, apparently we still have to figure this out. So, but these are, these are things that can be formulated in general abstract terms. 
but the way they would show up concretely in practice would always be surprising. And we'd have to be prepared for them. In other words, the, an index of the success of the movement would be the generation of new problems. Yeah. Right. The fact that we're still dealing with old problems, that just tells us how fucked we are, how stuck. Right. It tells us about failure and defeat. Success would be new problems. In other words, you know, like, look, people want to say we're way past Lenin. Now. I wish we were. People also say we're way past Marx now. I wish we were. That's the right. goal. Right. The goal is to get past this. But we have not. Yeah, like and, a new a new problem would be like which planet we're going to next. Absolutely. And, and a big argument over why we're going to this planet as opposed to that planet. I mean, that would be a problem, but let's bring it back to labor. Like what social activity counts as labor? Hmm. Right? That would be like an immediate problem of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And we have intimations of that now. So like there's social reproduction feminism. Sure. You know, or like an Andrew Yang, like what about the unpaid labor of women who are mothers and you know, homemakers and what about artists? Right? Aren't they the contributing Jerry to Rifkin society style econ people who are saying that all of our data is a commons and therefore we yeah. are you know, Get, get And they, they base our UBI off of the fact that our data is a commons and kind of yeah. asserting that. That's all very bourgeois, by the way. In other words, all of sure. that is bourgeois. And the point of Lenin and the state and revolution saying that we'd still be living under the horizon of bourgeois right in the dictatorship of the proletariat is, again, to say even these radical questions of what counts as labor and what counts as a contribution to society that should be recognized as a resource and supported by society, those are all bourgeois concerns. Those are all bourgeois horizon. We cannot see beyond the bourgeois horizon. When we think that we're most radically posing things beyond the bourgeois horizon, we're actually still posing things within a bourgeois horizon. Right, so even like the kind of, you know, like Heideggerian, well, Marx is bad because he accepts like a labor metaphysics, you know, and that's just part of this Western metaphysics in which everything is a tool and humans are tools and Marxism doesn't like question that. It just accepts it. It's like, but we haven't gotten past that. He would have agreed with you on that, though. Because he, he would have. He, he, he says right. in the question concerning technology that he doesn't see, he, he doesn't propose a solution. He says that there might be a, a, a piece of the solution in the problem itself. But, you know, when he's talking right. about in framing being the spirit of the age, he's not saying that there's a, he's not proposing, oh, I see what's beyond that, right? No, but he's pessimistic. I mean, he's a conservative. He's a right-wing thinker. He's conservative. He's saying not so fast Marxists. You think you got this figured out, but you're just at the beginning of a problem. And what I'm saying is that people like Lenin understood of course, we're at the beginning of a problem, meaning the revolution is the beginning of overcoming capitalism. It's not the end. It's the beginning. Of course, we're at the beginning of a problem, but we have to get to that beginning of solving the problem. So if we have eight minutes left, I'd like you to be able to close this out on your own terms. But I would also be mm -hmm, remiss mm -hmm. if I didn't at least raise a couple of things. So yeah, yeah. It seems to me like the conditions that we're facing today are fundamentally different in some ways than what Marx was dealing with and that Lenin was dealing with in his days. And it, it, I think capital is still the problem. I would agree that capital is still the problem, but that the 20th century showed us that there can be proposed solutions, say Stalinism, that have quote unquote achieved you know the solution to the, the problem called capital that don't that don't actually that achieve that solution and that can actually be way worse than what was there in the first place. I mean, now, worse. No, no. Yes. And then let me just yeah. like, so, yeah. so, that, so that's the concern. That's the mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. yep. And then with, with that concern, and I'm talking about the, when I say the, the change of conditions, well, it doesn't look like industrial Charles Dickens out the window. You know, we've dispersed this into every corner of the world. So it's, mm -hmm. kind of, you can't see it. And so, but, but the idea of like an international struggle, is one that, you know, the people who I meet who have things to say about it also have nothing to say about the World Bank and the IMF and the, 
you know, they don't they don't have anything to say about international capital except for stuff that Lenin already said. It seems mm-hmm. like. So right. I, maybe you'll want to touch on that. But the, here's the bigger thing for me is that when you declare the war for socialism under the pretense of an international struggle, the war to end all wars, it is a call for world war that doesn't no. end when one nation says that it ends, but it goes on indefinitely until you've won in every country, which means defeating nationalists in every country. Right. So for me, I feel like that's a huge problem that I want to see addressed. And I, I'm not putting it out like I have a solution, but I, it's not something that or I see neutralizing or neutralizing nationalism yeah. as an issue. Well, neutralizing nationalism in an issue would be fucking awesome if people were taking that approach. Yeah, by the way, we've already largely done that. It's not like we're constantly at each other's throats nationalistically. We aren't. When it happens, we're like, oh shit, people are still nationalists. But it happens rarely enough that we treat that as like a really shocking crime. You know? It's like, that's why, you know... Stalinism in some ways is worse than Stalin because Stalin conceded to socialism in one country, but he didn't reify the nation quite the way a lot of Stalinism does. Uh, you know, so it's just a funny, I mean, the way that I put it is and, example, well, just, just to, to concretize yeah, what you're saying yeah. and raise the huh? stakes of what you're saying. What is that? Is what you're saying right there. Does that implicate every time, it seems like a leftist YouTuber makes an essay about nationalism. They clarify this distinction between like uh, yes. oppressor versus oppressed when it comes to nationalism so that oppressed nationalisms are like, we need to uphold these. Or well, I, I thought you were going to go for a better distinction. What's um, the better? But yeah, there's no, that. The, the one I raise is sucks. just the one that you hear everywhere. I'm saying it's ubiquitous. I'm not saying that that's my position. That's a bad one, meaning like, Marxists and socialists, socialists, let alone Marxists, should not be nationalists at all, ever. I thought you were going to say the distinction between fighting for national self-determination or fighting against national oppression and nationalism. Right. So you can you can you can achieve national self-determination without nationalism. Right. Like you could have multinational states. You don't need a nation state to achieve national self-determination. Right. You just need adequate like democracy and rights of minorities and this kind of thing. Right. Right. So national separation is not a prerequisite for national self-determination by any means. But also really national self-determination isn't the goal. The goal is the self-determination of the working class. Right. Not of the nation. What the hell is the nation? The nation is just going to be the capitalists. Yeah. Right? Or the petty bourgeoisie, at best. At but it's not going to be the workers. And so, you know, not even national self-determination, just freedom from national oppression. And again, Lenin's answer to that is the only way to achieve that is socialism. So that's why, you know, Lenin's not a nationalist. And people running around calling themselves Leninists who are really nationalists should be ashamed of themselves because Lenin is spinning in his grave, right? So there's that problem. The other problem is with Russia and China and also Cuba to a certain degree and Eastern Europe to a certain degree and certainly Vietnam and Korea. These were, and I know that I've said this before, these are peasant countries that had to industrialize. So what was called the struggle for socialism in those countries was actually an industrialization, a proletarianization process. And that should not have been, strictly speaking, necessary. Certainly not in a forced way. So what the Soviet Union experienced in the 1930s, what China experienced in the Great Leap Forward, should not have been necessary. Meaning, you could have a gradual transformation of the peasantry, or maybe even you could just have a a different avenue of development. Meaning maybe people could remain farmers. I mean, there was a utopian vision to socialism, including Marxism, where the division between town and country was supposed to be overcome. Right? I, say, so, I, I think the division needs to be upheld and, and we need to respect it because city people keep acting like it can be erased. But there's a reason that people choose to live away from city people. And it's because they're reprehensible to the sensibilities of people who live in the rural areas. And I mean, it's possible. I mean, look. True. Maybe. Um, What I'm saying is, 
I just re recall my own knowledge, what I have to offer, a time when there was a really more radically open-ended vision for these things and okay. an optimism regarding them, that a changed relationship between town and country and maybe overcoming the invidious separation of town and country that we experience now. But what do you mean possible. by invidious? What do you mean by well, invidious? Well, you know, the, again, the idea that, that you have means. a kind of deep cultural separation. Okay. That would have a political consequence, as it does. You know, red states, blue states. I, mean, I, I would, I would say that this, this, this division is largely ideological in the in the mere sense that you know the the people who personify it in their identity in their identities are still on their fucking iPhones all day, like out in the woods. Yeah, it's, it's, I would in the say woods. the world's been bourgeoisified, meaning the world's been urbanized. Right. Our brains have been urbanized. You know, we've been turned in. You're, you're a capitalist, whether you're on the field or not. Exactly. You know? um, you're you're in the capitalist world, is you know. So in that respect, again, we have very misleading historical examples that we have to demystify and disenthrall ourselves of. We we really can't be thinking like. Again, the idea that like the Chinese Revolution is an advance over the Russian Revolution, something like that, or that the Russian Revolution was an advance over European social democracy before World War One. Not really. Like I mean, these, because they're they're all just trying industrialization in the ways that they try. Yeah, right. and I okay. just feel like this is not. This is very misleading, and you know, again, the idea that we're going to avoid. Socialist revolution in the advanced capitalist metropolitan countries. That's an illusion. I think that that is a really bad illusion that puts immediately like any leftists or socialists in like a place like the United States at a horrible disadvantage in terms of what they're trying to do, because it means that they're waiting for like the third world to rise up or they're waiting for like, I don't know, an internal colony like, which is a misconception of minorities in the United States, whether Chicanos or Blacks, right? It's just not like that. You know? This is like the, the, oh, well, once white people become a minority, Democrats can win, and that'll be the solution, which is... It is kind of like that. And, which is an actual and, thing that you hear repeated, and it's just insane because... White people are never going to become a minority, I have news for you, because Latinos and Asians are going to be white. What does that mean? They're going to intermarry freely. And it's just the whole white category that we think of now, it's not going to disappear. It's going to change. Meaning it's going to be like it always is in the United States, black people and everyone else. Because it you're really just is saying like that, that for racists, this one drop rule it will always be true. Well, I mean, hopefully not. not. I don't think it will always be true, but I think that that's the, the reality of racism in the United States is okay. that it's much easier for Asians and Latinos to free themselves of association with lower class than it is for black people. Oh, okay. I, 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 right. I so Henry yeah, Louis yeah, yeah. Gates Jr. breaking into his own house in Cambridge, Massachusetts is arrested by the police, even though like he's an elderly black guy who does not look like a criminal, but they see a black person breaking into a house and they're like, he must be a criminal because they assume he must be from the lower class. Right. In the United States, black codes for lower class in a way that Latino and Asian actually can, but often does not and will not in the future in a much more straightforward way. The other point would be, let's not just talk about black people, because West Indian and African immigrant people are also not seen as black. The police know how to tell the difference. Well, and and I and. So this was a interesting elaboration on why that quote unquote solution from democratic you know strategists is bullshit. But yeah, my mine mine is to bracket out the whether it's the, it's just say yeah even if we become a minority it doesn't make a fucking difference. It doesn't and I say make we, yeah. I say we under quotes here because I don't identify this way. But you know, in yeah, I know in, what you mean. Yeah. If white people become a minority, I'm sorry, but like fucking more Mexicans are gonna vote Republican. Sure, more, more the, blacks. 
Yeah. I mean, you think that upper class immigrants who come to the United States are all going to be Democrats? That's a crazy idea. Well, so. here's my here's my thing. Maybe my 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 closing thought with you will be this. Okay. Why we need to remember Lenin? Really? Um, there are like thorough reasons for it that we've talked about, but just as a first determination. Because we have to start thinking about being socialists, which doesn't mean Democratic Party people at all. In other words, we have to think, what would Lenin think about AOC? What would Lenin think about Bernie Sanders? Right? He would say, this ain't it. This is the opposite of what we need to be doing. That's what Lenin does. That's important. Now, the Stalin problem and the Mao problem, those are subsequent to that. Right? Why Eugene Debs was not a Democrat. Why he was not a populist. Why he broke with the populist movement and became a socialist. Mm -hmm. We got to think about that. Why he said Jefferson and Lincoln would be socialists, not Democrats and Republicans if they were alive today in his time. That's what he said. What did that mean? What was that about? Why, when Eugene Debs got the most votes he ever got in 1912, Lenin wrote an article and said, see, socialism is alive in America. Right? So, in, 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 in our previous conversation, I had brought up forced labor not being a better solution to coerced labor and you had said what they had to do to industrialize during wartime in a country that had not industrialized yet is not what we're going to necessarily have to do. Yes. But then yes. you followed that one-on-one -on -one by saying that you should have said that you might have to sacrifice for a few generations so that we can overcome labor. Well, that's another point that I would make about the socialists of Lenin's time and what Lenin represents which is they understood that it wasn't about their personal liberation. They understood that um, it was about the working class's struggle today for a future beyond capitalism that they themselves may not live to enjoy. That's exactly what you said. And so, but that as a proposition today in light of... Meaning we're not model humans. We're not like model socialist free humans here right now. We're not uh, going to uh, be, you know? That's not on the agenda, sure. you know, but to be a revolutionary socialist, to be a proletarian socialist does not mean achieving a higher state of like ethical consciousness and behavior. Sure. It means struggling against capitalism now. And what it really means is putting the working class in political power or preparing them to be able to take political power because where we are now we'd be asking working class militants to dedicate their lives to a struggle that may not be realized in their active lifetime. In other words, they might be in retirement and see the revolution, you know, like we're looking at that because if you look at the history of socialism, it's you know, like a 40 year thing, you know, to build a party, but to build a party to the point of revolution is like a 40 to 50 year process. And so it means young people today dedicating their active, healthy lives to building something that they're not going to benefit from. Normal working class people, are they going to jump on that train right away? No. What I'm talking about is if people are willing to read Althusser, come on. No, 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 no. I mean, obviously, it, it's easier to read Althusser than to organize the working class. But I'm just like, you know, it, it is a matter of consider other kinds of activity, right? Not just making your brain race through imponderable ideas that are half-baked philosophically. They're half-baked. I hate to tell you, they're half-baked. Right. You think ideological state apparatuses is just a total half baked, idea. total half baked. In other words, you, you know, like the real stuff again 
it, you know, you want to you want to know where Altazar is coming from, then you have to look at the actual pre-Socratics, and you have to look at Spinoza, and you have to look at that stuff, and then you have to look at how it's taken up by later people, you know, by <laughs> Kant and Hegel, you know. And that forty that forty year thing that you just said is Don't you know, spend 40 it, it years brings doing the that. obvious the obvious comeback which actually came up in the chat which is just climate change we don't have that much time so i just wanted you to be able to Oh no that. we do have that much time because climate change is not going to end the world it might right. make the world really miserable and horrible and it might create flooding in the third world and massive displacement of people and yeah. huge wars and millions of people dying but that's not the end right no and it in will intensify words, nationalism by the way, it will it will intensify things. It will create conditions that are that are even worse, and we will yearn for the days when we had time to read Althusser. I don't, but uh, let's hopefully... not let's not waste the time we have now, <laughs> right? But what I'm saying is, please, you know, and I know that this is going to fall on 99 out of 100 deaf ears, but for the one. Lenin. <laughs> Lenin is your man. He really is. Lenin is your man. And as a way to understand Marxism, in other words, Lenin's a figure, and he's not the be-all, end-all, but he's, a, he's an interesting guide that helps illuminate the landscape of the shipwreck. Right. So you're you're on the beach at the end of the world and you come across the shipwreck. That's Marxism. And there are all sorts of ghosts in there. Lenin's your best guide. Through the haunted best house guide. of Marxism. Yeah. Um, you know, Adorno's no slouch either. But Lenin's really, you know, a really important figure. And, you know, I mean, Engels is good. There are so many good figures you know it doesn't begin with lenin it doesn't end with lenin but if you blot lenin out of your vision you're going to miss a lot i have a million things to say but we don't have time for me to say any of them so cool. i just want to thank you so much for coming back on to clarify your position i look forward to ha uh, hosting that conversation between you and mcgowan someday in the future and cool. hopefully after i've done a lot more of your readings on your syllabus and done more discussion groups with platypus and then we've had more conversations one-on-one -on -one, to hopefully have continuing this because i think that this is part of the 40-year struggle that you're talking about so thank you thanks thanks dave take good care